Everything okay, Melissa? It's not Melissa. And nice of you to ask. What?
Hi, everyone. Uh, it's nice to see everybody streaming in. It's about 1229. I'm going to leave it maybe till about 1231, give everybody about two more minutes to come in, and then we'll get started with the short course in R short course, and we are ready to record. <laughs> All right, so we are recording this session. Uh, if you do not wish to be recorded, please go ahead and turn off your, uh, your camera right now. That's totally fine. Uh, I have put a link for the day over in the chat. So it's r3-rmedicine.netlify.app. And I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so you can see what that website looks like. So this is basically the collection of all the links that you'll need throughout our time together today. Uh, if you go to start, you'll see links to the two slides up top. You'll see also some kind of bookmarks over here, which are some links that you'll need throughout. Uh, one thing I wanna call your attention to early is this little cloud icon. We are gonna be using our Studio Cloud for this workshop. So if you could go ahead and click on that, it should take you to the RStudio cloud space. And I'm gonna demo how that looks um, for you. I'm signed in with my current um, admin account. So you will see something slightly different. I'll demo that in a moment, but that's on the website as well. So go ahead and make sure that you have an RStudio cloud account. If you don't have one, you can create one. I recommend using um, a, a GitHub authentication or another G Google authentication so that you don't have to create a new account. And I'm gonna go ahead and get started then. And again, we are recording, so. All right, so we're going to start with the basics. I want you to go here and log in to our studio cloud. So the short link is rstd.io forward slash r3 dash cloud. And now that I've moved on from that slide, it is going to be at the footer of all of the slides. So you should always be able to see that our Studio Cloud link, and it's also on our website as well. So be sure to sign up for our Studio Cloud and go ahead and get in that space. And before we get really started, I'll make sure that you guys all have accounts. Uh, so short introduction, our team today. Uh, my name is Allison Hill, and I'm product manager for data science communication at our studio. And I have taught at our medicine, I think the past three years, is that right, Stefan? Yeah. The past three years. Uh, so I really love coming here. I'm actually a previous medical researcher. My uh, former job was assistant and associate professor at Oregon Health and Science University. So I'm excited to speak to you all today and to share something kind of new. It might be a little bit of a surprise to everyone, but we're really excited. We have a team of our studio people here to support us. Uh, but our instructor team is myself, Stefan Kadalki, and Paul Villanueva. <laughs> I'll let each of them maybe introduce themselves really quickly, and then we'll be passing it back and forth between the three of us. Stefan, do you want to do a brief intro for you? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Allison. Um, I, I also can't uh, tell you guys how excited I am that we were able to get uh, Allison back to, to teach again at Our Medicine. I was going to say for the third time in a row, and uh, she... <laughs> So that thunder from me. So um, <laughs> I'm um, I, I'm an assistant professor of lab medicine at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and um, and uh, I'm a, I'm a very heavy R user, uh, and uh, I'm the chair of this conference. So um, so I'm, I'm very happy that I was able to get um, uh, that I was able to help out with this workshop. And uh, thank you so much for for joining today. And then. Paul is my intern this summer. Paul? Yeah, um, like Allison said, I'm our intern at our, uh, at our studio this summer, working on the R Markdown team. Um, before this, oh, still am. I'm a PhD student <laughs> at Iowa State University uh, studying the impact of human activity on the environment. So I use a lot of R. I use a lot of uh, reproducible, reproducible research is something very important in our work. And very excited to share uh, some stuff with you today. Yes. So I'm really excited that Stefan and Paul could both join me today. And we also have, I understand, a pretty strong RStudio team behind us as well to help out. Um, I'm going to encourage the RStudio people here to, uh, to speak up um, and feel free to talk. I know we have Tom Mock joining us and I believe Charles Teague from uh, the development team. So I want to welcome everybody and we'll be uh, sharing some, some newer tools with you all today. So we're pretty excited about it. Um, 
I think the tools that we're going to share with you today are um, things that I, I don't actually believe are going to help solve science or medicine's reproducibility crisis. Uh, I believe having been a former scientist, I believe there's a lot of uh, deep seated problems that uh, can stem into the re reproducibility crisis. But what I do think the tool chain that we're going to teach you today can help with is something that at least I experienced as a researcher and I think a lot of my colleagues did as well, which was the confidence crisis. Um, so I used to obsessively check my data and be worried that the, the data that I was presenting or the data that I was publishing or the data that I was trying to get um, to use for getting funding wasn't the exact accurate data or there had been some changes or you know I had various pipelines of scripts and wrangling code that I was using and always trying to make sure that I was using the most up-to-date data and I had used the most up-to-date script and that the figure that I was showing was the one that was tied to the data that I thought it was. Uh, so I used to spend a lot of time doing this until I discovered how to use our markdown effectively. And so we're gonna be showing you some tools today that I think will actually help with that crisis. It also has the benefit of making your work more reproducible. Uh, I also think it helps with what I think of as the cheese crisis. So uh, this is actually probably like a very mild version of what my schedule as an academic researcher used to look like. Uh, the yellow blocks were pretty much covering my my, uh, my day. And I had very few little white blocks within which I could actually code and I could go into a project and I could you know, revisit where I was at and get up to speed quickly and be able to you know, be able to leave myself enough breadcrumbs so that the next time I knew I would have to do that, I would be able to jump right back in and be effective and uh, do smart things with my data instead of going around in a hamster wheel. Uh, and using our markdown also helped me with that because I was often on several grants at a time. This might sound familiar to you, several different research projects. And within a given week, you might be flipping and flopping between various research projects. And they might be very similar, but have just slight differences. So it's very easy to start feeling like you don't know exactly where you're at. And I think the tools that we're gonna show you today will also help with what I think of as the cheese crisis. But it does take changing your mental model a little bit. Uh, so, you know, the, the image on the left is the typical blank Word document that you get when you open up Word for the first time. And for some reason, you know, while blank documents often uh, create sort of fear in us when we're programming. Um, this kind of document doesn't scare you as much. It, it looks very friendly. There's the source is the same as the output essentially. So as you're writing, you're actually seeing what you're getting. So it's kind of the ultimate, like what you see is what you get um, editor. Whereas using source code to produce outputs can feel a little bit different. You have a source code that is stored in a file and you then do another step to be able to create the output. And so you often have these, these twins, twin files living next to each other, one that's the source file and one that's the output file. So you might be rendering to HTML, for example, if you're lucky and you're able to use HTML, you might be rendering to even Word or PowerPoint formats. So it's often a little bit of a mind switch to change your mental model from thinking about one document that is the sole source of everything and the thing that you end up sharing with people and then splitting those up mentally and moving on to being able to think about, I've got this source file and I have this output file and I want that link between the two of them to always stay there because that link is my reproducibility. So that allows me to be able to say, I know that the source that I'm using is creating the output that I'm seeing. So here's a little preview of what we're going to be going through today in our schedule. Uh, so session one, what we're in right now, is going to go for about 50 minutes total until 1.20. And we're going to be covering just some basics. Uh, we'll take 10 minute breaks every 50 minutes. So from 1.20 to 1.30, uh, my time, Pacific time, whatever time zone you're on, from 20 after the hour to 30 after the hour, we'll be taking a break. And then we'll start again. We'll have another 50 minute chunk, 10 minute break another 50 minute chunk and 10 minute break. And then we're gonna wrap up with a 30 minute uh, Q and A and a little bit of a wrap up also. Uh, the format today is gonna be some live demos. We also have some slide decks that will present, uh, excuse me, present some information. And we also have interspersed in there some solo activities called Your Turns. And those are gonna be activities where you do jump into our studio cloud and work with a document, try rendering things, work with code chunks, so you're going to be using 
our studio cloud during those year turns. And in those year turns, I usually set a timer. That's not to stress you out. That's to help pace you so that you see how much time we're going to be spending on a certain activity. And the whole idea is that <clears throat> if you want to, you can opt out. You can do as much as you want or as little as you want. You can sit back and relax and just watch this whole workshop or short course. Uh, it's up to you. Uh, and sensitivity to people's different situations during the pandemic, we've decided to not have group activities during this workshop. So you're going to be working on your own during those solo activities. Uh, and that leaves you free. We know that you are often taking time away from work and other family obligations, children at home, other family members at home uh, to attend this kind of short course. So we want you to feel comfortable keeping your video off and, you know, needing to multitask as we all are doing right now. So video on or off is up to you. I'm gonna ask my um, co-presenters, Paul and Steven, to keep their videos on so that I can see some people. Uh, but everyone else, you're free to turn it off if you'd like. Um, and so it's really kind of a choose your own adventure style. Do what you want. We hope you get something out of it. And actually, now that I say that, I, we're all going to get something out of that <laughs> because I can guarantee you that every single person in this workshop is going to learn something that you didn't know before. And that includes me. Um, and that includes probably Stefan and Paul as well. So I'm going to do a live demo right now of just logging into our studio cloud so that everybody can see what that looks like. So I'm going to take this link here, the rstud io r3 cloud and i'm going to open that up in a different browser window that has a different account open for me oops our stood.io r3 cloud and so you should get a screen that looks like this that says join the space Allison, i think we're on a different screen than you sorry oh thank you Okay, I'm going to stop the share. Thank you very much. And please do interrupt when you see that. I'm just going to share my whole darn screen then and hope that I've turned off all the notifications. <laughs> okay. Is that sharing screen? No. Let's try it one more time. Is that sharing screen? Yes. Okay. All right, so this is what it should look like when you follow that first link, the rstud.io forward slash r3 dash cloud. You should get this question, join space. I want you to click join space. And then you should see welcome to r3. So this is our workspace in our studio cloud for this workshop. And if you go to projects up in the upper tab, you'll see the two projects that we'll be working from today. So we have O1 basics and O2 authoring up here for now. And those are assignments that when you go into them, you'll enter the project. It takes a little bit to open up. It's deploying. It's doing a lot of really fancy stuff under the hood. And then when it opens, you'll be able to see essentially the RStudio uh, desktop IDE experience in a browser window. Okay, so my project is now open and you can see that I have console over here. I have a file pane over here where it shows you the files that I've added for you already. So there's 01-markdown, 01-explore. And when we get to those, we'll tell you which ones to open and which ones you need. But for now, I want to make sure that you all can enter the space and you can access the projects and that you can open up 01-basics. So if you're struggling, I can't answer any questions right now uh, because I've got a lot of things going on on my screen and I'm trying to limit distractions. Uh, but Paul, Tom, and Stefan can all help if you throw it in the chat. If you're having issues, please throw it in there and they can try to help you problem solve a little bit. I'm going to stop sharing on this screen because for some reason it won't let me share my whole screen. So I'm going to go back and go back to my slide deck. Okay. So that was getting started with our Studio Cloud. So uh, what I would like for you to do is to hop into that 01 Basics project, open up 01 explore.qmd. And I want you to take a few minutes to try to identify these parts in the source code. So there's some metadata, there's some text, and there's some code. Uh, and if this was easy, you can try to find all the code that produces a plot. So I'm going to set the timer for two minutes, and let's take a bit to explore that 01explore.qmd file in the 01 basics project.
Okay, two minutes is up. Um, can everybody see my cloud screen right now or can you only see my slide? Slides. Just the slide, just the slide. Okay, I cannot figure out how to share the whole screen on this one. It only gives me the option to share a whiteboard. Okay, I'm gonna switch slides again then. So I'm sorry, I can't share my whole screen for some reason. Okay, so this is the file that I asked you to explore. And I already see the questions uh, percolating and I know exactly what you're thinking. So I would love to know, um, I can see everybody um, uh, in the participants view. And if you guys have used um, uh, Zoom before and you know how to do reactions, if you have that ability, you can give thumbs ups. Um, I'm wondering if people can give me a thumbs up for uh, if you thought I was going to be talking about our markdown today. I see a lot of thumbs ups. Okay. Um, so that would be a totally natural assumption. And we actually had this labeled, I think, our markdown for reproducible research at first. Uh, we've actually changed our plans. We are teaching uh, a new tool to the um, new to the our studio. Um, uh, family, a tool called Corto. And so what we're going to be doing is teaching you guys for the first time, this is the first cohort of people who are going to be learning this new tool. And it's essentially going to be a successor to the R Markdown ecosystem. And hopefully at the end of this workshop, you'll see why we're so excited about it and why we're excited to demo it for you today. So a QMD file is different from an RMD file in that a QMD file is a Quarto markdown file. So .QMD is the extension. But if, even if you were expecting an R markdown workshop today, I'm hoping that what you saw when you looked at this file was something very familiar. You saw some metadata at the top in the YAML, right? We're familiar with the three dashes. If you're not familiar with um, YAML, this is a way of having keys and values as metadata for your document. Then you see some text here. And um, so uh, this is a note that um, Paul wrote to myself and Stefan as we were prepping for this workshop. And then the parts in gray are code chunks. Those might look familiar to you. This is the way that we interact with R inside a QMD file. And you can see some other kind of fancy things like there's a, um, a hashtag in front of some words that indicates a header. We're gonna talk about all of this today. But if you're used to R Markdown, this should look very familiar to you. So I'm gonna to have to stop sharing my screen and go back to my slides. Okay. So we just looked at the source anatomy for O1 Explore QMD together. So we saw that there's metadata, there's text, there's code, and we're gonna go through all of those elements in this first section. Uh, so I know that many of you were thinking, what am I looking at? A QMD file is going to be the file format that we're going to use today to interact with Quarto. Uh, we are using Quarto in this workshop. Quarto is a tool that you've probably never heard of, uh, and that is for good reason. We're all actually beginners here. I'm a new Quarto user, as well as Tom, as well as Paul, as well as Stefan. Uh, Quarto is a very new tool, and we're all getting used to it. Uh, so you're not alone. Uh, you're probably the first ones to hear about it. Uh, so here is the documentation site for Corto. It's at corto.org, and we'll be sharing these links throughout the workshop. Uh, the corto.org website is actually pretty thorough right now. It has a lot of great information in it, but what I want to cue your attention to is this link up at the top called About. Uh, so this gives you a little bit more of a description about Quarto. It's a scientific and techni technical publishing system built on Pandac. And the overarching goal of Quarto is to make the process of creating and collaborating on scientific and technical documents dramatically better. And that's exactly why we thought this would be a great uh, tool as a fit for this workshop. So it was a change of plans and we're really excited about it, but this is also the first time that Quarto has been taught. So that's why I have a number of our studio people here to help out. So what is Quarto? I just mentioned that it's a technical and publishing system built off Pandoc. And if you're familiar with R Markdown, this might be familiar. Uh, a lot of the R Markdown output formats that you have access to when you use the R Markdown package or an extension package are based off of Pandoc, which is, uh, as kind of illustrated here, sort of a Swiss army knife of a document converter. So it allows you to take Markdown as input and export to a number of different file formats. You can export to PDF, Word documents, PowerPoint presentations, and HTML for example. So what is Cordo exactly though? 
It is the command line interface. So it's installed at your terminal, actually. It's not an R package. And that when you leave here today, if you'd like to install it locally, there are some instructions on the Corto.org website for installing it. Uh, in your RStudio Cloud instance, we have actually installed it on the back end for you. So you'll be using Corto in RStudio Cloud with the RStudio IDE. So the RStudio IDE has support for Corto documents with the daily version build. So if you've never used a daily version build, there's a way to download daily versions of the RStudio IDE that are fairly stable. And so you can use that to interact with Corto locally as well. So come back to the slide if you end up wanting to go further with Corto and you want to get out of that RStudio cloud uh, place that I've put you in. But also Corto, because it's not an R package, that means that for all the different output formats, if you're used to the R Markdown ecosystem, you might be used to being a little bit overwhelmed by the number of packages and figuring out which package goes along with which output formats and how you can create X if you want to be able to just do that. What is the package that helps me do that? And then now I have to learn a whole new maybe API for doing it. And oh, now tab sets don't work. Or now cross-referencing only works with this output format. You might have experienced this pain if you're an R Markdown user. And that's some of the pain that Quarto is designed to take away from you. Uh, also, why Quarto? Um, before, when we have R Markdown, that's a great tool for people who use R. But if you're a person who's on a team that uses Python, uh, this was often kind of leaving the Pythons out in the cold. Uh, they were all alone. They didn't have literate programming and didn't have the easy ability to be able to render documents that had their figures and tables and all their code in it that could actually be version controlled and shared very quickly and easily. Uh, it, was, it was for our users and it was built into the RStudio IDE. But now with Corto, we can have these two play together. So we can actually have Python and R code. And so the question of what's a QMD file, a QMD file is a Corto mark, uh, markdown file that allows you to have both R and Python chunks in it. If you wanted to use a .rmd file, uh, that actual file extension with Corto, you could, but you'd only be able to use uh, R chunks. There's also uh, the ability to use IPython notebooks as well. So how does it work? Uh, it works very similar to how R Markdown works in that you have good ideas, code, and data. And that's what you're coming into this process with. And you want to put them in something. And so you can put them in a number of different formats. You can put them into an IPython notebook. You can put them into a QMD file, or you can put them into an RMD file. So you pour all of that work into it, and then either Jupyter or Nadar takes the baton from there and deals with your code and inserts it into a plain markdown document. So that means that by the time it goes through that cycle to the .md file, it's sort of deactivated. There's no executable code in there anymore. The code has been executed and any output that's been created, plots or um, statistical analyses that have been run, anything like that, that's all been done and you're seeing the output in the actual MD file, but there's nothing executable after that. After that MD file is created, then Pandoc takes the baton and says, okay, what do we want to make this markdown file into? And then you can render to HTML, PDF, or the Word doc, for example, or any of the other free plus that Pandoc supports. And you don't need to install anything additional there's no additional R packages that you need. You're just able to use all of those. And you're able to use all of the core functionality that we're going to show you with Corto and all the output format. format. So let's take a first look at Corto. Uh, I want us to all render together. So I am going to unfortunately have to stop my sh share screen and reshare my screen and go back to my RStudio Cloud instance. Can everybody see my cloud? Paul, I can see you. Can you thumbs up me? Can you see my cloud? OK. All right. So. Uh, if you go over here, you might be used to seeing a knit button, but because we're using a .qmd file and because we have a uh, part in our YAML that we're going to explain in a little bit uh, called format, you might be used to output if you're an R Markdown user. Because we have that, the IDE actually automatically detects that we're in a, a Corto file and it gives you now a render button. So I want everybody to click on the render button and you should see a job startup like I'm seeing. You can see it's processing the file. This is actually the NIDR par portion. Um, the, this is all the NIDR portion. So you can see that it's actually kind of going through the chunks and it's executing the R code. 
And then you can see right below that after it exports 01explore.nit.md, then you start seeing what Corto actually produces. And this is output from Corto. So you can see that it's calling pandoc and we're rendering to HTML from Markdown. The output file is gonna be named 01explore.html. And you can see that there's some additional add-ons in here that come sort of by default. It's also reading in some metadata that I have in my YAML here. And then you can see it created the output and what popped up in my viewer is actually that output. So you can move your panes around a little bit if you wanna see this more clearly. In the viewer pane, you should be able to see a rendered HTML file that is this document. So you can see that it has a title, it has Paul's name and a date, it has the text, and you can see that the code blocks that we saw over here uh, that are in gray are also in gray over here in the rendered section. But you can see that there's now this addition of outputs. So for example, loading tidyverse outputs a bunch of junk. We'll talk about how to clean that up. Uh, there's also actual output that you want. So for example, this code chunk here that says glimpse mock data, you can see that code chunk right here. And then it actually has some output that you can see, which is helpful for when you wanna share the actual results with somebody else. You can see there's a summary section, there's some more R output, and I believe there's a plot at the end. There's a very, uh, very simple plot at the very end. Two plots, there we go. So that is a simple Corto uh, document and how to render it to HTML. I'm gonna stop my share and back to the slides. All right, so that's the basic anatomy. We talked about metadata briefly, text, code, and output. They're all in there in the output, in the output file that you can see. And there's basically a one-to-one -one correspondence between those things in the source file and in the output file, the only addition is the output all of a sudden. So how we're gonna organize this workshop is I have a series of QMD documents that you're gonna run through. And they're each sort of thinking of like um, the, the letters that I used to write to my collaborators and research assistants when I was working on research projects. So we're kind of using Dear Data as an inspiration to have these be sort of the, the more in-between products from a research study that you'll need to use typically, instead of thinking about the final, final research paper as the thing that we're working on. So, I think of uh, the sort of the addressee as the metadata, then you've added text to it. You also have plots, you have tables. We're gonna talk about all of these elements in our QMD files. So what's inside? We're gonna start with the text. And I want Paul to take the screen from here and he's gonna do a live demo of the Corto Visual Editor. All right, thank you, Allison. Um... Yeah, how can you share a whole screen here? <laughs> There's no option. I accidentally clicked on whiteboard once, but I don't see it. All right. So we'll start off with the slides. Can you guys see my screen? I see slides. Okay, cool. Awesome. Yeah, so today, um, because Cordo is based off of uh, Markdown, we're going to have to we're gonna take some time to make sure that everyone's familiar with using Markdown uh, to write documents together. So in particular, we're gonna talk about the R, the R Studio Visual Editor. So in later editions of uh, R Studio, you might've noticed this little uh, draft button in the upper right hand corner. This transforms the, the document from the raw text format to rendered Markdown uh, output. So I'm gonna switch my screen over to the back to the cloud Okay, and then I'm gonna close, I'm gonna go back to files. I'm gonna open 01-markdown.qmd and I already clicked it, but uh, so right now, if you're in raw text mode, you should see something like this in 01-markdown.qmd. I'm seeing a blank this button. screen. I'm sorry? Is anybody else seeing just a blank black screen right now? Yeah, it's black. Yes. How about now? There, yes. It's much okay. better. I have two monitors and it keeps jumping around, but okay. Anyway, so we're back here. So we have the 01 markdown.qmd file open. And right now it's just plain text, but if we click this draft button on the right-hand side, you're gonna be able to transform it into the visual editor mode. And what the visual editor mode is doing, it's rendering the text as 
from Markdown to the actual formatted output. So today we're going to go through, uh, so in the next couple of minutes, we're just going to go through this document together and make sure that we're all comfortable, one, using the visual editor, and two, writing stuff with Markdown. Uh, so this first line here, I put a link here uh, that you can follow just to have like a little cheat sheet handy on the side so you can um, refer to it later if you want to do some, uh, if you forget how to do stuff in Markdown. So I'm going to go ahead and close this window out. But yeah, basically Markdown, um, well, yeah, so if you want to make a header in Markdown, you could, pre, you could put uh, hash marks in front of the text. So these are different sizes of the different headers. But let's go ahead and make our own header here. So like, for instance, we could say uh, one hash mark, and then this is a header. And then that Markdown knows to take that and put it into an H1 element. Another way we can make a header by taking advantage of the visual editor is by going on the new line and we can press the slash command. And this, this, so this is what the visual editor is doing here. It gives you this option to insert different uh, elements and options here. So we could, if we didn't remember how to do that uh, hash mark to make the header, we can press slash and go to the top, the heading one, top level heading, and then it'll get it ready for us. So we could say, this is another header. So yeah, that's how you use headers. And an important reason to use this is because it helps you navigate the document. So if you click on this line over, or this icon over here with the little headers, you'll see this little uh, sidebar menu show up on the right-hand side where there's actually links to all the different sections of the document based on where you put these header, uh, these header lines. So for instance, I put, this is a header up top. We can jump down to tables on the bottom. We could jump back up by going back here. So that's very useful for navigating through a document, but also you know, separating your thoughts to make it a little bit more readable. Uh, let's see what our next uh, slide says. Okay, so headers, we went through this. Uh, so next we're gonna talk about uh, editing text or formatting text within the Markdown file. So on the left-hand side is the raw text that you'd be putting in. So, and then on the right-hand side is the rendered output. Can everyone see this, Allison? Okay, awesome. <laughs> so on the left-hand side, if you put two asterisks around the text, it'll show up as bolded text on the right-hand side. If you do an uh, under bar, underline <laughs> uh, beforehand, we can see uh, it gets italicized on the right-hand side. And then, Let's go through a few slides and then we'll jump into the R Markdown documents for not switching the share screen back and forth. So we're gonna, we'll talk about formatting text. We'll talk about making bullet lists. So on the left-hand side, if you wanna bullet a list of items, you just skip a new line, just like here. And then you put this dash in front of your uh, text items. So then by, and then just putting a new line afterwards. So then on the left-hand side, we see whooping cough, polio, diphtheria, hepatitis, or a host of other infections. And because they have the dash in front of them, they get rendered as a bulleted list on the right-hand side. And then similarly, if we begin the list with uh, numbers, then it'll, uh, item, it'll enumerate the items when they get rendered. So we see one here, one here, and one here. And it's a list just like before, but now it gets rendered as one, two, three. Uh, so something to point out is that you might be curious like why it's just ones over and over. And that's because Markdown knows how to sequentially order them. It knows how to number them correctly. So instead of having to wrestle with saying like one, two, three, then maybe sometimes you wanna like change this to move it later in the list. And then you have to switch all the different numbers around. Markdown knows that if you just put all ones down there, it'll correctly number the items when you render the document. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump back into the document so we can See this in action. All right, so like right here we have, uh, I'm gonna jump out of the visual editor so you can see the raw text. So we see uh, vaccines are one of the greatest, or one of the great triumphs of modern medicine. And then when we render it in Markdown, we get the bold and italicized just like before. And then also we have the bulleted list, like we said here. And you can add items to this list by just going to the end here and just saying enter and then another item and yet another one. And so again, if you don't remember how to, if you forget like how to make a bulleted list with plain markdown, you can use the visual editor 
to take advantage or use the visual editor to start a list for you by pressing slash and then look for list. So I'm just typing li and then bullet list pops up. And then it, well, it's there's no separation here, but so it puts it in with the other list, but it starts the list for you. So this is another list. And again, we have, so then moving on to numbered lists now. So again, we could just go back to the, we could go to the end of the last line, press enter, and it'll automatically number it for us. Uh, here is another item. And so keep in mind that this is the rendered output. If we go back to the raw text, oh, I guess, oh, visual editor is being smart about it for us and <laughs> actually editing the markdown to be the correct numbers. But let's go ahead and let's, make another list. I'm gonna go back into the visual editor. And just like before, I can press slash, press li to go to the numbered list. And then visual editor will start another list for me. So I could say um, one, two, and three. And that works very nicely for us. All right, so next we're gonna talk about images. Um, so let's jump back to the slides for a bit. We're gonna talk about images and links. So the, the, the markdown syntax for an image is this, um, these empty brackets, so an exclamation point, these empty brackets, and then a, a link to the image in parentheses. So then when it gets rendered into markdown, Markdown knows to take whatever image is here and render it as an image. Uh, and we could also do links in kind of a similar way. Uh, instead of starting it with an exclamation point, we just leave it alone here and just have open brackets, um, the label of the image, and then the, the link to where we want, the hyperlink to where we want the link to go. So when this gets rendered, we get this nice little hyperlink here that we're used to, and then we could go ahead and just click on that. It'll take, us, it'll take us to that website here. And let's see what's on here. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, see that in action on in the cloud. Okay, yeah, so in the visual editor, it's already rendered the uh, image, but let's go ahead and just verify that when we jump out the visual editor that we see the exact same thing here. So. We see the exclamation point, we see the caption or the alt text, and then we see the link to the image. And it renders. And again, if you don't remember how to, uh, if you don't remember the syntax, you can do slash im to pull up image. And then you can actually browse. So visual editor will open up this window to have you browse to the location of the image. So it's in, oh, I guess it's a hyperlink. So I'm gonna copy the hyperlink from here and just paste it in there. And then Mark, the visual editor will take care of uh, making the actual markdown syntax for us here. Paul, can I interrupt you real quick? Yeah. I wanna make sure that you don't skim over the sizing there of the images because that's another really awesome feature about images in the um, markdown visual editor is being able to resize them. Right. So. Um, instead of having to like wrestle with HTML um, or CSS to resize the images, you can actually edit it directly with the visual editor. So when you click on the image itself, you see this little border pop up around it. Um, I'll point your attention to this triple dot thing here. So uh, when you get more advanced with uh, like using CSS and stuff like that, you can mess with all these things directly. But for now, we're gonna talk about just changing the width and height like Allison uh, pointed out. So we could lock the ratio here and just mess and just change the width and the height, and then Corda will take care of uh, writing the markdown uh, styling to change the size of the image. So we can see actually how, marked, how the visual editor is doing it by just going back, by turning off the visual editor and going back into the plain text and seeing that it's just adding the styling element of width 300 on the end. Yeah, thank you, Allison. All right, and then next on the slides, we have a check-in. So I'm going to um, switch again, jumping back and forth, a lot worse than alt tabbing. So check-in, how do you add headers in R Markdown, or in Markdown rather? So 
I guess. <laughs> Allison, do you know how to add headers in Markdown? Oh, I will take a guess. I think it's the third one. <laughs> wow, incredible, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, the hash uh, is the header, and the number of uh, hash marks you put in front of the header makes the header a different size. And again, like if you, um, I, provide, I provided that cheat sheet at the top of the document so you could look it up yourself. Or if you didn't remember that, um, take advantage of the visual editor uh, slash command to pull up these different things. And then, like we saw earlier, uh, for to make a list, we can either just make a bulleted list by putting the um, a dash mark in front of it, or you could put an asterisk also. And you can make a numbered list by doing the one right in front of it. Uh, oh, okay, so let me jump through tables real quick and then we'll, I'm gonna jump through tables and citations and then we're gonna have a little activity for you guys. So let's jump over back here. So I think one of my favorite things about the visual editor is how easy it makes tables in Markdown. So to demonstrate, how nice it is. Let's jump back to the raw text. And this is the markdown syntax for a table. Um, you basically get to draw these lines and make sure that they, make sure that they all line up. Um, and there's different syntax for centering the text and everything. And for simple tables, it's not too bad. But when the table starts growing or we need to change the content of the cells, it can get pretty uh, onerous. Um, onerous. But Visual Editor makes it super nice because when we jump into Visual Editor, there's actually a, a command for inserting a table. So just like the other commands for Visual Editor, we press slash and just start typing in something. So I, I start typing table and table pops up and it asks me how I want to make rows and columns. So I'll just say three and three. And we'll say breakfast, lunch, dinner, uh, and then yeah, then we could say pancakes, sandwich, steak. And let's jump back into the, the raw text. And we can see that Visual Editor is actually writing the markdown syntax for us. So we don't have to worry about aligning it properly. We don't have to worry about making sure that uh, it's centered nicely on the page or whatever. It just works. And beyond that, we actually edit the table pretty nicely in here too. So for instance, I could just if I have too many rows, I could just right click inside this table and delete the row. Uh, I'll delete this row too. I'll delete this column. And it just takes, and then the visual editor will just take care of that for you. Some other cool things with the table is that you could also change the alignment of the columns. So I could right click on this column, click center, click center, or I'll, I'll change it to the right. And it'll take care of that for you. So this, these are the, this is the syntax for centering a column or uh, right, aligning a, right aligning a column over here. And then finally, something I think is super cool about the visual editor is that you can actually add directly add citations to the documents using DOIs. So here's a couple of DOIs here, and we're just gonna go ahead and just, show, I'm gonna show a few different ways that we can add citations. So I'll say, actually, let me go down a little bit. So citation one, I'm gonna say, so the first way we can add citations is by doing, well, first I'm gonna copy this. I'm gonna say at, oh, I need to be in the visual editor. Sorry about that. Yeah, so this is this is only working in the visual editor. So I'll say at, and then you notice that this little thing pops up where it says search or DOI, and I'm just gonna paste in the DOI here. And you see that it pops, this really cool pop-up pops up <laughs> with the citation information for that DOI number. You also notice that's creating a references.bib file. Um, so if we click OK, it's going to create this references.bib in our directory. And it's also going to go to the top metadata and tell the file what the directory, what the references are. So that's one way to do citations. So let's, so here's another way to do citations. Uh, just like before, we can do a slash citation. And now there's a bunch of different options here. Um, actually, I need to grab this. Sorry about that. So let's go back to citation. And there's a bunch of different options here. So if you have um, uh, your own bibliography file, if you have uh, Zotero in later versions of, the, R of uh, the RStudio dailies, you can actually pull from your local Zotero files. Uh, you could search uh, in a couple of different databases. But again, we could just put, paste in our DOI here and it's gonna look it up here. And it's gonna show us how the, it's gonna look. 
it's going to ask us where we want to add the reference, and we can just go ahead and insert that. And then finally, if you a third way we can insert these is by using the insert menu up top. We could say insert citation, and then we get the same menu up there. So let's go ahead and just do that. I'm going to add this citation. No oh, items. Oh, I think this is actually in my paper. That okay? Never mind. This is embarrassing. I swear it's real. But anyway, so now that we have the citations added in the references, um, let's go ahead and actually render the document and. Let me show you what Visual Editor will also do for you once you have these citations. So we have, we added those citations at the very bottom, and I'm actually prints out a bibliography for you as well. And this is because you told uh, in the top uh, metadata what the bibliography is. So because it has that, Visual, uh, when we render it with Cordo, it's going to output that bibliography on the bottom. And so just to make it a little bit nicer, we can just say, oops. You can just say uh, header one bibliography. Let's go ahead and save that and let's render it again. Hmm. Well, it's not it's not rendering for whatever reason, but yeah. So that's. All we have for now. Let's now let's go to an activity for you guys. Uh, let me go ahead and uh, go it's back. It's actually one nineteen, uh, so I want to stay true to my schedule. So uh, we are going to take a ten minute break right now, um, and we will meet back at one thirty after the hour. And if Robert Klein is here, I want to make sure we troubleshoot because he's not having the forward slash working in his QMD. So I'm going to um, uh, set a timer for myself and share my screen real quick. Let's see if I can. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. And then Robert, if you're around. Oops. Uh, we'll go until 1 uh, 30 my time. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So what is going on? Let me go to my, um, I'm going to stop sharing this screen and go back to, I don't know why I can't share overall screens, okay. but if I go into my RStudio cloud workspace, um, here's the, the O1 explore QMD, which you could be in, but it doesn't really matter. It could be an RMD file or it could be a QMD file. So all the features that Paul just described in the visual editor should work. Uh, with RMD or QMD, but we happen to be within a QMD file. So I'm going to click on this little draft icon here that says switch to visual markdown editor. And then it's the first time I've done this in this project. So it says switch to visual mode. You're activating visual markdown or activating our markdown visual editing mode. This mode enables you to compose markdown using a familiar word processor style interface. There's a link to the documentation. And then it also allows me to say, don't show this message again. So I'm going to go ahead and click and say, use visual mode. And so now you can see kind of more of like a rendered version with the outline, the YAML is kind of boxed off and here's the text. So I'm going to do a slash. And when I do that forward slash on a line all by itself, I see the, um, the menu. So Robert, are you not seeing that if you follow those steps? That was it. I was not ah. in that, uh, the mode. Gotcha. The right mode. Okay, yes, it. this only Thank works you. in visual editor mode. Yeah, so um, as Paul demonstrated, you get, it's kind of like a hot key, like you can just do that and find anything. You can scroll down and see anything. So if you're just like, ah, I don't even remember, you can actually insert emojis this way. Um, so I can actually choose from the emoji picker, like this is the bomb. Um, and then you can also use, if you don't wanna use that forward slash, you can use any of these buttons up top, which are probably more familiar from a word processing standpoint. So sure. being able to bold, italics, underline, uh bulleted list numbered list links <laughs> all of those things so yeah okay. everything's possible when you click on the draft icon but you Super. can also Thank do you. this in a dart rmd file right now like if you download yeah. the um e not even a daily build of our studio but if you download the official build of, of yeah. our studio ide this is all built in right now and works with our markdown files okay good all right, great. Well, I'm glad we were able to troubleshoot that. Um, I'm going to finish up my break and then we'll be back. Uh, I've got my timer going down here. Uh, okay. Let's see, I'm going to stop my share and then reshare so that everybody can see my timer. 
All right, perfect.
have a little bit less than two minutes left, but I see a really good question about I have papers written in our markdown .rmd files. Are there any known issues with building rendering old RMD with Cortel? Uh, yes, um, they're not necessarily known issues, but they're things that you're going to have to change about your source to be able to have them work in Cortel. So the first one that has gotten me several times is that uh, you need to change your YAML. Uh, if you have knit to a certain output format with our markdown, you have that specified with the output key in the YAML. With Cortil, you'll need to use the format key, and you'll need to make sure that one of the formats supported by Pandoc is the one that you want. Um, so, for example, uh, you know, if you have knit to something like Distill right now, uh, we haven't fully um, uh, replicated the distill experience in Corto yet, but it's on the roadmap coming up this fall. Uh, if you were using the articles package, for example, for a, using like a LaTeX article template, that has not been done yet in Corto as well. So it depends on what you're trying to mimic. Uh, if it's a plain R Markdown document, using the R Markdown package to render and using uh, one of the base output formats, those should be largely replicable in Corto. You just need to be able to find which pandoc output format that maps onto uh, and then there might be some other yaml keys that you'll need to kind of go through and massage different output options book down <laughs> book down and blog down i know it always auto corrects to blow down um so uh book down you can uh do a corto book right now we won't have time in this workshop to do it but let me show you in the documentation where that is well first we're back from our break. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, I wanted to show, first of all, the documentation for the visual R Markdown editor, because this is actually available. Um, I'm going to throw it in the chat. This is available right now in the R Studio IDE. You don't have to use a daily or anything like that. You can use this with R Markdown, um, uh, any R Markdown document uh, other than uh, Shrengen slides. I believe those are the only ones where this does not work currently. Um, so you can use a lot of the features that Paul just demoed with an R Markdown document. The difference is that we're using the daily build right now of the IDE, um, a special build for our workshop so that we can use a lot of these features with Corto built into the IDE. Uh, let me move, let me float this. Okay, and then um, in Corto, uh, we're not gonna be able to get to it here, but uh, the people who are asking about book down and blog down, you can go into the projects tab of the Corto documentation and you'll see creating a book, book structure, book cross reps and book output. Uh, there's also websites, but there isn't gonna be something exactly like a Hugo site in Corto. Um, Corto is gonna be more um, uh, creating like a distill website or an R Markdown website. If you've made a website like those before, um, that looks kind of maybe similar to this documentation site that I'm showing you right now that was built with Corto, the Corto docs are built with Corto. If you wanna make something like that, then you can make a website using Corto um, and get pretty far. Um, same with a book. But if you're interested in replicating the exact blog down experience, I think that's gonna be um, uh, a little bit different, but you can, uh, take individual posts or content from a blog down project and render them with Corto, but still use maybe the blog down package under the hood to use to access Hugo basically to serve your site, do all of those things. Um, so that might be a little bit more of a hybrid approach. But uh, one of the great things about Corto is that it's made for single uh, input files also uh, immediately expandable to multiple input files. So it has this notion of projects and you can create multiple, um, uh, you can add multiple RMD files or QMD files as inputs and have them be rendered into a book, a website, uh, and have that work the same way as it did when you were making the single document. Okay, so we're a little bit behind schedule. Uh, so I'm going to head back to where we left off. So with Paul, we talked about the visual markdown editor uh, and all of the things that we can do to our text. Um, the next thing that comes uh, after text is code. So uh, when you're in a QMD file, just like with an R markdown file, you can insert R code. Um, I'm going to try to, let me see if I can get my participants back. Um, I'm wondering how many people here feel very comfortable with knit R chunks. I'm wondering if y'all would rather me um, skip that if that's kind of like very basic if people could give me a thumbs up how if they feel very comfortable with knitter chunks I'm just kind of trying to 
I see thumb, some thumbs up, which is great, but not a lot. So I'm going to keep going forward with knitter code chunks. And those of you who feel really comfortable with it, you can maybe sit back and relax a little bit uh, and know that we'll we'll get where we need to go. Um, this is the first time teaching uh, teaching Corto, so there's going to be some some things that I've mistimed here. Okay, so let's do a little bit of a review. So uh, one of the things that I think is trickiest about working with any um, computational document is figuring out uh, what you're going to see printed when you actually do the rendering. So you've got this source code and you've got this output and there's nothing worse than being surprised by what's in or what's not in the output. So using code chunks, we insert our R code into our documents. And if you think about what is the fate of this chunk over here, so I'm taking a data set called mock data and I'm piping that to this function called distinct. And what you end up seeing when you render is actually the, the code itself plus the output. And that's because NIDAR produces all uh, output faithfully. So that's its default is that it's gonna show you both the code and the output. So what fate might you predict here if you saw this code chunk? Um, you might have a guess that you would see something print out. Uh, and this has often taken me and other new users by surprise as well. But here you would actually just see the code because I'm not actually printing anything. Um, so when you would render this, unless you actually printed the object in underscore sites, you wouldn't see anything in your output file. Uh, if you actually did do that, then you would be able to see that, for example, in this mock data set, uh, there's only one site currently. So what about this one? This is some ggplot code that's taking the mock data and uh, making a, um, a bar plot out of that data. So if you had this code in a code chunk, you would see both the code and you would see the plot that it creates in your output when you render. So in, uh, let's see, it makes it really hard to switch. I'm gonna stop sharing. And I'm gonna go back to sharing my cloud. Let's see, I can see Sylvia. Sylvia, can you thumbs up that you can see my cloud? Thank you. All right, uh, so here I'm in my 01 Explore QMD file and you add code chunks the same way as you would in our markdown document if you're used to that. So for example, I'm gonna go down to under summary and I'm still in visual editor mode here. It doesn't matter which one you're in, this works in either mode, but you can click the insert a new code chunk. And then here, like let's do the mock data pipe it to uh, distinct arm. And then you have the option when you're working in any um, QMD document or RMD document to say, okay, I'm in the uh, R Studio IDE. I want to run all chunks above it. And you can see that it's actually running those. It's running those. I think there was a question about an error. I don't know that there, I haven't seen an error in this file. I hope not, but uh, I didn't see a response. So uh, I'm seeing output that goes along with each chunk. And then I clicked on that one that said run all previous. So that means run all chunks above it, but not run the actual one that I did. So to run the actual one that I just uh, added is I can run this current chunk. And then you can see the output here. And now one thing you can do as well is you can click on this little gear icon at the top, and this is in the IDE um, in our studio. And if you don't like this, say output in line, you can say chunk output in console. And I'm going to remove it all. And then you can see that if I head back up to where I was, now if I run all the chunks above, it prints all of those outputs to the console instead of adding them here. So here I'm going to run that same chunk again. And you can see that that, that prints there. Either way, that's more for your interactive use. And you can still render when you want to create something shareable. Let's see, did it actually render? There we go. And then Bath asked a really good question about why is it, why is that job essentially um, watching file for changes? Why is it staying open? So the idea is that you're able to actually um, set this up so that you have render, um, that you're rendering on save. And so anytime you'd actually, uh, anytime you'd actually, ooh, sorry. Day. <laughs> Anytime you'd want to be able to make changes to it, it would detect that. If I click save, there actually is a button on my local machine that has render on save, um, and it's not showing up in our version here. 
Uh, but that's why I think it's watching for file changes. So it's not totally fully featured here in the our Studio Cloud IDE, but there's a button that allows you to do that. So I'm going to stop sharing there, go back to Firefox. OK. All right, so that was our code. So we showed how to add chunks, how to run them interactively to be able to run all the chunks above it, be able to run the current chunk, and as well being able to render and just seeing it all. And then also changing where that output goes when you're working interactively. So whether it goes in the console or if it stays um, kind of in line with where the code is, two different options. So uh, the third thing that we've seen when we render is output. And this is really great. This is what saves us all that time copying and pasting when we're trying to create something that we want to share with somebody else and say, you know, one of those observations where you're like, huh, this is weird. Can you take a look? Or one of these things that I find in my data that's really exciting and cool and I want to share with somebody. But you have to be able to share the output to be able to do that. So the ways to massage how your output looks when somebody else looks at it is to use uh, chunk options. And these are enabled through the NIDAR package. So even though we're using a QMD file and we're using Corto now, we're actually still using the NIDAR package under the hood to be able to render our, our, our R code. So we're still doing a little bit of knitting. Uh, so here's a chunk, for example, showing glimpse mock data. Uh, and you can see that over here, it's printing out faithfully the, uh, both the code itself and the output. Now, if I wanted to change that, and if I wanted to say not show the code at all, uh, you can use the knitter chunk option called echo. And you can set these chunk options differently in Corto. And this is actually going to be enabled eventually in all of uh, our supported uh, R packages as well that use knitter under the hood. Right now, it's only enabled in Corto. It's the special syntax that allows you to have chunk options using a hash symbol, so basically like a comment symbol, and then a pipe. Um, so the pipe is right above your backslash. It's like a shift, shift and uh, backslash uh, on my keyboard. And so you enter hashtag pipe, and then you can list your uh, options there. So here, echo, colon, and then false. So if I use that, it's the same thing as putting it in the chunk header. And you can do either way, or you can even mix them. You can have a hybrid approach. Uh, so here you can see that I'm not echoing the code. Uh, you can also do the same for evaluating the code. So you can set eval true, eval false. So here you would only see the code itself. You wouldn't see the output from it. You can also use a chunk option called include. And this is really helpful if you just want to have code that runs in the background, but you don't necessarily want to share it. So you might have some gnarly code that creates a GG plot that you want to share with people, but you don't necessarily need them to see how the sausage was made. You just want them to evaluate the plot. So you can set that chunk option to be include false. Combining chunk options, you can stack them essentially. So echo true results hide. Uh, you can also string them together using a comma to separate. Now notice that here there's a colon to separate them. And if they're in the header, there's an equal sign. So that's kind of a gotcha. That's going to be a little bit uh, hard to get used to. I made that mistake multiple times in preparing for this workshop. So uh, road roadblock ahead. Uh, another two options that are really, really helpful when you're first doing uh, a QMD file or an RMD file is message and warning. Um, so this is showing you the, the typical output from loading the tidyverse, which is noisy, right? It tells you all the packages that it loads, and it tells you all the conflicts, and you often don't want this to end up in your rendered output. So you can do message false, warning false on a chunk that includes that, and then all you'll see is that the package library tidyverse is loaded. So again, to combine chunk options, you can either stack them if you want to use the hash and pipe method. Um, so place after a hash and pipe, stack multiples, and use a colon uh, between them. Another option is to place between the curly braces and separate them by commas using a list. And in that case, you're always going to use an equal sign instead of a colon. Either way, you can stack multiple chunk options so that you can create um, uh, a very custom, uh, customized kind of report for a certain kind of audience based on what you show them and what you hide from them. Now there's a ton of chunk options. There's 53. Uh, so we only touched on a few of them, but I encourage you to look at the NIDAR documentation because there's a chunk for a chunk option for almost any use case. So if you've ever thought, oh, I want to be able to hide this, but not show this or show this, but not show this. You, you're probably in that our uh, option uh, ch chunk option world. 
So we've gone through text. That was a visual markdown editor. We've talked about our code. And then we've talked about the chunk options for controlling how the code looks when it's output. Uh, and the last part that we're going to talk about right now is metadata. So this is the part at the very top of the document. So we're sort of working back up to the top of your document, that part that's in between the three dashes, it's fenced off. That's your YAML block, it's called metadata. Um, and YAML stands for YAML Ant Markup Language. I think it actually changed recently. Um, but if you're thinking to yourself that I don't know what YAML is and the, the name YAML doesn't help me and the spelling it out doesn't help me either, then you're not alone. Um, it's basically a way of specifying keys and values together. Um, and the way I think of it is the way I used to organize my Word documents, for example, was to basically store my metadata in my files themselves. Um, you know, I'd maybe store the date that I um, that I wrote an article or wrote uh, you know a note to someone. Uh, I'd put that on the document itself, or I'd maybe put it in the file name, or I'd put it you know, somewhere that I could track it because I'd need to keep track of these things. And so that's kind of like separated out in your um, QMD files. So it's actually stored in the same document. So you can see the author name, the title, the date, for example, there's some just basic metadata that you would put in a document. And the nice thing is that it does some uh, things that allow them to show up when you actually render the document as well. So the title will show up as the title. And so it's helpful for being able to organize your files and keep that stuff at the top. Another thing that's nice about Corto is that you can actually store execution options up in your YAML as well. Um, oh. There we go. Uh, so execution options refer to those knitter chunk options that we just talked about, but now we're talking about setting them for the whole document. So if you've used our markdown, you may have gotten used to using a setup chunk. And here we're actually gonna put them into the YAML now, which is a nice and refreshing way to do uh, global options for your whole document. And the way you start with this is uh, using the execute key in your YAML to kind of cement this down. And then you can stack them one on top of each other. So here, if you used this, in your YAML for your document, you'd uh, hide the code for every single chunk, you would hide the messages and you'd hide the warnings and you'd set the output width for all figures to be 100%. So you can still use individual chunk options and you probably should to override these settings, but this is nice for being able to set up your default chunk options. And then they're up in your YAML, they're really easy to track and I hope easier for people to collaborate on documents and be able to see what they're changing. The other thing that you can put into the YAML is your output format. So we've already shown you that we've been using format HTML. You can also use a different output format. Uh, I'm going to ask you to go back to your cloud setup and I'm gonna actually do it with you instead of using the timer because I wanna be cautious of time here. So I'm gonna demo how to use, how to knit to a, or render to a Word document. And I'd love for you guys to follow along with me if you'd like in your RStudio Cloud project. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add docx as an output format. So right now you have a document that has format HTML and I'm going to add docx onto it so that it has an additional format to render to. So let me escape. Here and then reshare my screen here. Okay, so I'm back in 01-Explorer QMD. And you can see that the format is here, format HTML. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to hit enter on format and I'm going to indent it uh, for the HTML. And then I'm gonna add default here. And that's what allows me to be able to have just plain old HTML as an output. And then I'm also gonna add docx here as a default. And then when I click save, we should be able to see when it renders. So what you get this notice in RStudio Cloud that it's finished rendering um, a QMD document to docx. And since it's a docx file, it's gonna allow me to download the file. So I'm gonna click allow and I'm gonna open it locally. And then I think I'm gonna actually have to stop sharing my screen and then start sharing it again to show you the Microsoft. There we go. Uh, so this is the Word document output from, uh, from the exact same thing that we were just looking at as HTML.
So you can see that it printed everything out faithfully uh, and it looks pretty darn good actually for a Word document. Um, so you can get out of that copy paste mode of taking figures that you're making in R, inserting them into Word documents to be able to share with other people. Uh, and you could set this to be, um, you know, echo false for the execution options and not show any code, for example, and just be able to share this with people so they could see the outputs. Okay, I'm going to share my screen again. Okay, uh, so that's how you add additional built in formats uh, and you can see all the formats on the Corto documentation site. So when you click on this formats up here. You see HTML PDF word. There's some markdown formats and then there's um, some miscellaneous formats. There's a lot of Pandoc um, supported formats. So presentations and then there's even more formats. So that's the way to find out is the format that I want to make here. Okay, uh, the final thing that I think is really cool about Corto that I wanna make sure that you know about is that you can add output options really easily to the output formats. And there's a ton that are built into Corto that are things that you've probably wished for if you've used our markdown across the different packages and that some have sometimes have been enabled, sometimes haven't been. So I wanna really appreciate what's built in there. Uh, how you save output options in your YAML is to stack them and nest them underneath the output format. So whereas before we were starting with format HTML. Uh, if you wanted to add an option for HTML, for example, to add a table of contents, you would nest TOC under HTML. So how we used a single format, um, hopefully you're thinking to yourself, okay, I'm going to be using the format key. It's A. Um, Allison has done B numerous times in a Corto document. It's not going to work and you're going to get mystifying errors. Paul knows. <laughs> so it's hard to break that habit. If you're an R Markdown user, it's format HTML. Uh, and how do you set options for a format? Actually the same way that you do with our markdown. So you nest the option underneath the format itself and you need to indent it. So the format itself is indented two spaces and the option is indented about four. And I just showed you how we actually stacked another output format on top of each other. So the way was to uh, indent them both two spaces, HTML and tag on default at the end and docx, for example. Um, so B is wrong here. And then how do you add output options to one of the formats? You would just stack them again and, and just use the, uh, the four, uh, the four indentation, four space indentation to nest it underneath. So A would also be right. I think A was right for all of them. Okay, so this is another one where I would normally leave you on your own for five minutes, but I'm gonna walk you through it because I wanna be conscious of time and I wanna be sure to take a break at 20 minutes after the hour. So what we're gonna do is I'm going to demo how to edit your YAML and add some very cool features from Corto uh, into an HTML uh, output format. So the ones that I'm going to focus on are adding a table of contents. This is a really popular one uh, that you may have used with our markdown. And I'm going to open up that documentation page so you can see where I'm seeing where I'm going to be following. So uh, if you were on the Corto main website, you'd go to formats, HTML basics, and then you'd see table of contents right below that. So I'm going to be following that instruction. I'm also going to show you how to add commenting because uh, if you've ever used hypothesis before, you can add commenting very easily to your HTML documents, which is nice without needing to know JavaScript. We're also going to add a theme. Uh, if you're used to R Markdown, you may be used to using themes. I really like using themes for changing the look and feel of your document right away with different built in fonts and colors, and they just look nice and polished. So I'm going to quickly do that. And I'm also going to add code tools. Um, and then I will try to make it so that I can also add code folding um, at the very end of this. So I'm going to stop sharing this screen and go to my cloud. OK. So first up, I'm going to actually remove docx for now. And I'm going to try to make this bigger. There we go. Okay, so the first thing I said I wanted to do was add a table of contents. So I hit enter after that HTML, I go into spaces and I'm gonna do TOC true. If I click save and I click render, 
Let's view what that does right away. Let's see. There we go. It's not showing up in the small window. So if you do knit this in the viewer in our studio, I believe if I went this way, I'd be able to see it. It's not showing up in the viewer pane for some reason. So, but if I click on this little view, this little kind of show a new window, you can see that it pops out and it does show me the table of contents over here. This is a really nice little table of contents. I can click around and you can see that it highlights where I am actively among those four sections. It's labeled table of contents. So that's adding TOC true. So next up, what did I want to do? Paul, <laughs> what was the next thing? I was going to add a theme. Was that my second one? Um, commenting. Yes. Sorry. Commenting. <laughs> commenting. And then I believe it's, is it hypothesis true? I'm going to have to go back. Let me see. It is, I guessed correctly. Okay, commenting hypothesis true. So I'm going to render that. And I'm not actually sure if this is gonna update. I'm gonna, for some reason, I'm gonna close, X that out and then re-render. Okay, so you can still see my table of contents. But I've added hypothesis JS, which means that if I, it's supposed to be that if I uh, highlight and then right click on it, it's supposed to show me, and it did when I tested it, uh, the ability to comment. Okay, I've probably done that wrong, although I see a comment in chat, which might be somebody telling me how to do this. Nope. <laughs> okay, um, I'm going to leave. Is it commenting? Did I do it right? Uh, try comments instead of comments. Commenting. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I knew I had done something wrong. <laughs> okay. I'm going to go back. Ah, there, we go. there we go. Okay. So comments hypothesis true allows you to have annotation and highlighting for people who um, go to your website. Now, this is just obviously a local preview, but if you were to publish this on GitHub pages or Netlify, for example, you'd be able to have people interact with your, um, your document pretty easily. And that's a really nice thing to have built in. That's using hypothesis JS under the hood. You can also add utterances comments as well. Uh, and then I think I wanted to add a theme. And I think I'm going to try Lux. I believe Lux is a theme that is bundled with Bootstrap. And those, the options that are there for you for theme are um, listed in the documentation as well. So for some reason, it's not updating my live preview here. But let's see. There we go. Uh, so it's a quick way to change the look and feel of your site, the way to know what's possible. Uh, and it's linked to from the Porto documentation is to go to the Bootswatch site and you can see all the different themes, the way you pick them or the way you select them is to, um, to use no caps. So it's like Yeti, Yeti with a lowercase y. I used Lux with a lowercase l and you use the theme key. So real quick, I'm gonna show you flatly. And ooh, which was the one that I sent you, Paul, that was so ugly? Oh, it's like quartz or something? It was so bad. Something awful. Uh... It's a good one for like making sure that my visuals are <laughs> working. <laughs> what was it? Um, I'm, I'm digging through. It was quartz. It was quartz. Yeah. Right? Okay. Okay. Quartz. <laughs> Or it's like get, a Lisa Fr Lisa get Frank ready. Theme. Yeah, I told I tell you <laughs> that I can give you polished reports, but I could also give you this. <laughs> so get ready for it. Ah, uh. <laughs> it's ombre and <laughs> uh, Charles so, uh, says uh, sketchy is a pretty good one too. Sketchy is a pretty good one too. Let's try sketchy. Yeah, I don't see what's wrong with it. <laughs> yeah. I think the people at Chop would love reports written like that. <laughs> So it's not updating in the viewer. 
but there's sketchy is a good one. So that's a really obvious one that I've changed. Um, so I actually really like Lux and I like Flatly. Those are my two favorites, but you are welcome to choose your favorite because they're all possible. I think Minty is another one that's got some cool. It's just a little bit too light for me. I have aging eyes. There we go. Kind of makes me feel like I want to dial up the contrast on my computer. <laughs> So that was theme, table of contents, and then I added hypothesis. And now the last thing that I want to show you is code folding, because code folding is one of our more requested features uh, for all the R marked on output formats. <laughs> uh, and it's one that's very hard to implement similarly across the different output formats. So that's one thing that Corto really um, uh, has made a lot easier. So I'm going to add just code folding true and render it. And I'm going to try to lower this so you can see. Oh, let's see. Did I do it wrong? I'll try code fold. Code fold, see? <laughs> this is why you're here, Paul. <laughs> Code fold. Beautiful. So now it's nested in these nice little code blocks. So you can quickly drop down and see the different code used to create it, but it's kind of hidden in like a little details tag. So it makes it kind of nice. Um, the other thing I wanted to show was something from uh, code tools. So since I can't look at my help at the same time as I'm doing this, Paul, code tools. <laughs> Is it just true? Yeah, code tools true. Okay, great. So this one is really nice and it mimics one of my favorite behaviors of our markdown, which is you get this little button at the top and this allows you to show all code, hide all code or view source. So this would allow you to kind of auto expand all those folded code blocks or auto hide them all. And then also view source pops up the source code in a nice little window for you. So you can see all of it at once. So if somebody is just like, oh, I wanna see the raw RMD for it, it's in there. It also actually has a clipboard icon here, which is very nice. Uh, so you could just copy the whole source, for example. Um, some of the other things that are built in, I wanna show you real quick as well. Um, so these are things that are built into Corto that I didn't even have to set up in my output options. So for example, one is if you go to any of these headers, you'll notice that I have, let's see, I'm gonna switch back to the Lux so I can see better. This is like too low contrast. There we go. Now you can see the word code up there. It was invisible on the last one. So show all code, hide all code, view source. And then if I click around, you'll see that I have the different headers, are basically anchor links. And then you can also see that every chunk has immediate um, copy paste. So you can see that little clipboard icon, you can click on it, it will show you that it's copied pasted. You can turn that off, but it's easily on uh, in any Corto HTML output format. And then you'll also notice that I have numbered figures. So here I have figure one, participant enrollment by site, I have down here figure two, participant enrollment by site and study arm. So this is another really nice feature of Corto that you might have enjoyed in Bookdown, for example, if you've used any of the R Markdown output formats and it's in there. Uh, another nice thing that you'll see when I hover over this figure is that there's even an anchor link to that figure, for example. So you could link somebody to that specific figure that you're seeing. And you can, uh, let's see. I don't think I have an example here. Ah, I don't have an example there, so I'm not going to mention that. So code fold true, code, uh, code tools true. Those are really nice features. And those are all covered under um, the HTML basic section of the Corto documents. So I'm going to head back to my Firefox so I can show you here. HTML basics, we're there. Uh, and what I showed you was table of contents. We did commenting. I didn't have any references in there, but there are automatic reference um, pop-ups here. So for example, if I hover over Nidar there, you'll see a little nice pop-up. Nidar is in our package for creating dynamic documents. Um, there's external link formatting. So there's a lot of stuff built in. There's tab sets. Uh, 
So if you've loved your tab sets and you've felt limited because we haven't been able to enable them across all the output formats, you can have tab sets in every output format now. Uh, you can have them in your uh, presentations built with Corto. You can have them built with your HTML documents built with Corto, all of that good stuff. Okay. So here's where I ended up. Oh, and I didn't show code summary. That was the last one. Um, so that's how you change the actual word um, that shows up. I won't show it now, but you can try it on your own. Uh, when we take our break, you can play around with that. Um, and it's also still documented under HTML basics. So um, I will wrap up this section with what is hard about YAML in general. <laughs> and so y'all saw me suffer a little bit with YAML already, which was that it's hard to know the right key. Um, it's easy to forget the right key. I tried code folding instead of code fold. Um, uh, I tried commenting instead of comments. Um, indentations matter. If you've already been using our markdown, this should be a familiar pain to you. We're actually working on some better um, debugging tools in the IDE itself. So it'll actually kind of show you when you've got, when we think you have your indentation wrong and when your keys might be wrong. Um, but that's really one of the challenging things about uh, YAML. Um, and when you do get an error, it's rarely an informative error message. It's usually some kind of like gobbledygook about parsing, and that can be really intimidating. Um, so YAML isn't exactly user friendly. We're trying to make it friendlier. Uh, it's also difficult to know which output options are relevant for different formats. So the Corto docs are pretty good about this. They separate out by format, which options are there. And of course, for HTML, there's a lot more options built in for each format, but uh, the developers have spent a lot of time making sure that there's some pretty cool options available for Word and PDF as well. Um, and it's also easy to forget the possible values for a given key. So whether something's true or false, or whether it's a string, for example, if it needs to be in quotes or not, um, all of those things can be kind of tricky about YAML. And those are sort of just uh, things that I want you to realize are totally normal for all our Markdown or Corto users um, is grappling with YAML problems. Um, I'm going to skip this new data dump because it's 2.05 and I've only got till 2.20. So I'm going to move on to slide deck number two here. Um, but you can go back and try this later. Uh, I had a new data set that you could use to, uh, to import and use the exact same uh, 01 Explore file to be able to re-render and see data for Boston, Seattle, and Denver instead of just Boston. So I'm going to wrap up with these takeaways and then move on to slide deck number two. So uh, use YAML to set up meaningful metadata for your document. This includes you know, name, title, date, things like that, but that's also your way of specifying output formats, output options for, that, for those formats. And then with Corto, it's also your way of setting up your, your whole document execution options. So if you've been an R Markdown user, you don't need to do a setup chunk anymore. You can use execute as the YAML key and then nest your global options in the uh, execution options of your YAML. You can also style your document. You can use YAML to add um, options to style, themes, CSS, all of those things. That's the ways to change how your document looks and renders. You can add code folding. You can add commenting. There's a number of things that are built into Corto. So I encourage you to look through the documents and see all the bells and whistles. Uh, organize your text, use markdown headers uh, with a single or up to six uh, hashtags. Uh, this is a really nice way to organize your document. And as Paul showed you with the visual markdown editor, especially it allows you to see that outline mode really quickly and allows you to jump around a larger document pretty nicely. And I really encourage you to organize your, your code. Um, I'm going to show you a little bit more about NIDAR uh, in the next section. Um, and also styling your text using markdown bold, italics, bullets, and lists can also make your, uh, your QMD documents more readable for other people. And we also talked about styling your output. So using NIDAR chunk options like include, message, warning, eval, uh, all of those. And my final bit of advice is to render early and render often. We talked about the interactive mode when you're working and running code chunks in our studio. You can run all the chunks above. You can run the current chunk. Those are all really great as you're iterating and trying to work out your code. But I encourage you also to do the full document render early and often so that you can make sure you don't end up in a place where your document doesn't render. So I'm going to stop my share real quick. I'm going to look through the, the questions real quick. Okay, I'll talk about conversion at the end because I see a good code completion for the YAML header. Stefan, that is on the to-do list. I am telling you, it is, it is being worked on right now. Auto-complete for YAML. I know. Okay. I am going to share... 
screen again. Okay, and I'm going to get started on authoring. I'm going to see how far I get. <laughs> um, so make sure you're still logged into our Studio Cloud. We would be working off O2 authoring as the project now instead of O1 basics. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and show you my screen as well. Uh, I'd like for you to open up o2draft.qmd and read the source file. Take a few minutes. I might um, shimmy this down to four minutes instead of five, just to shave off one minute. Um, I want you to look at the source and answer the following questions. What's the output format? Are there any output options? Are any knitter execution options set? Anything in the code look foreign to you? And finally, render this file look at anything in the output, um, uh, see if it surprises you or not. So let's take a few minutes. I'm going to do it at the same time as well. So you can just watch the screen or you can play around in our studio cloud. It's up to you. Can anyone give me a thumbs up if they've been able to get the project to load yet? Oh, there's mine. Okay, so some people are in it. <laughs> I'm just getting throttled here. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, we have about a minute and a half left. I'm gonna look at my participant view. Can people give me a thumbs up if they've been able to look at the document, O2 draft.qmd? Okay, it looks like some 17 people, 18, okay. Thank you.
Okay, we're 20 minutes out or 20 seconds out. I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next thing. Um, so I'm hoping I'm going to have to switch the screens again. Okay, uh, so here's what I was looking at. And um, so, you know, we've got metadata, we've got a single header here note. So if I look at my outline view, it's not super helpful. I might want to add some markdown headers to make it a little bit more organized. Uh, but you can see that I have a bunch of code chunks here and the sum and substance of those code chunks is I'm loading in some packages, I'm loading the data, and then I'm also loading in this external um, figs.r script that I wrote. And that was just so that I didn't overwhelm you with a bunch of um, figure making code. Um, but what that, that source file does is it gives you access to these, these four plots, so these four plot objects. So when you rendered, you should have seen them stacked right on top of each other. So we have an age histogram, a survival percent plot, um, a survival by days plot based on follow-up status and study arm and um, an adverse events um, uh, percent of patients plot. So frequency of adverse events by type and treatment arm. Uh, and then I also have a static image down below. So hopefully you guys notice that as well. That's, happen that's happening to use NITR include graphics for that um, image. Uh, and then there's a, final, there's a final plot as well. I'm um, talking about counts by site, participant counts by site. Okay, so figures. Um, similar to code chunks in your output, I think I, I have often fallen into the, the pit of not exactly being able to predict where my figures are going to go or when they're going to show up. Uh, so I always wanna point out that you have to be able to print your plots to be able to show them uh, when you render them. So if you saw this kind of plot um, in your code, will it print? Yeah, absolutely. This is going to print and it's also going to show the, the code chunk above it as well. Um, what about this? This is actually saving an object. So this code would create an object called age underscore histogram. Uh, and then this big chunk of uh, code underneath is actually how you make that plot. So if you were to render this into the output, no, you would not see this. Um, you would only see the code used to make it. You would see it, however, if you printed age histogram as the object. So uh, it's always important to remember what things you're saving as objects and which things you're trying to print and show other people. There's a lot of chunk options for plots. When we talked about the knitter chunk options, we talked about include, uh, eval, message, warning, but there's some specific ones for plots that are super helpful as well. So there's some related to fig resolution, figure size. Um, so there's fig.width, fig.height, fig.asp. Um, and a uh, fig device. So if you wanted to change, if for some reason for one of your publications, for example, the journal required all figures to be, um, you know, PNGs, for example, that can often happen. So you can set that fig device and you can do that both for an individual um, uh, figure, an individual chunk, or you can actually do it in the execution options as well and make it for the whole document. Uh, and then the place to find all the documentation for that is in the knitter chunk, knitter options um, for plots. So there's that link at the bottom. So my favorite ones to share are uh, out width. This is a really quick and easy way to be able to resize a figure. So again, using the syntax of adding um, options below the chunk. So the hash and pipe symbol with out width equals 70% in quotes, resizes it just a little bit, um, shrinks it down. You can also do out width down to 10% and it shrinks it down even smaller. So these are ways to change the way that the plots look when you render. You can also add fig cap, fig dash cap as a chunk option. And this is the way to have a figure caption added to your figure. So you can see here that it says figure one, age distributions, and it's not going to show the code used to make the figure because I've set echo equals false. So all you're going to see is my beautiful age histogram plot and a numbered figure with uh, this caption, age distributions. And that's because I used a couple things that are very clever. So it's not just fig dash cap. Um, I did use a chunk label. And so chunk labels are ways for you to apply a label to an entire chunk of code. Um, so you can use hash pipe and then label. So here I'm labeling this chunk peak. Uh, you can also add it in the header right after the R. So here is labeling a chunk option as peep. 
um, peak. The only thing that's a problem is if you have duplicate chunk labels, you will get an error that looks like this error in the parse block, duplicate label peak. Uh, so you want to make sure that you're using unique chunk labels. But if you do this and you use chunk labels, then you can get um, some really nice benefits. Um, and one thing that I like to think about is whether your chunks are houseplants or crops. So essentially, are they worth naming or not? Um, and I think all of your chunks are probably worth naming. You've put a lot of work into them. I think they're houseplants, not crops. I think we need to name our chunks. It makes it a lot easier for you as an author. Um, a good chunk label that you can use uh, lists over here. So you can use my plot, my dash plot, my plot camel case whatever you want to do. What you don't want to do is use underscores um, or spaces in your chunk labels or really, frankly, any other punctuation other than a dash. Uh, so my rule for thinking about chunk labels is to think kebabs, not snakes. So you want words on a skewer, not anything with a lowercase underscore in it. So once you've got a chunk label and you've got a figure that you want to be able to cross-reference, you have to do a couple things to make it look nice and show up as a cross reference with Corto. So the first thing is that you need to label the chunk option uh, with a label like that starts with fig dash. So it has to be fig dash age or you know fig dot fig dash site. Uh, it has to be fig dash. Uh, and then you also want to use fig cap. Uh, and then you would be able to reference it in text and create a cross reference to a figure that way. So this text right here at fig dash age would create a valid cross reference there. So this is really nice. This is something that previously was only enabled in Bookdown and its descendant packages, but this is now available in single documents in Quarto and projects in Quarto. So you can make books with cross references, single documents with cross references. So to reiterate, you have to have a labeled chunk that produces a plot. The plot label has to start with fig dash and you have to use a figure caption using fig dash cap, not fig dot cap. Um, but then you can have cross references for any format that you wanna use. So I'm gonna quickly show you how to do that. And I'm going to look at the time, 2.21. Actually, um, Stefan, do you think I could quickly demo that when we come back from the break before you take on the next section? 2.21, let's take nine minutes and then we'll come back and do that and then segue over to workflows.
about four more minutes and then we'll get started. Okay, we have about a minute left. I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen. Getting ready for... Okay, so Stefan, I'm gonna to try to be, do this as speedy as possible. <laughs> so right at 2.30. <laughs> no worries, we don't need the 200 words per minute. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Do you mind if I also show layouts real quick then? Okay. All right, it's 2.30. I'm going to do a quick demo to show you how to add figure captions and also maybe show you how things can go wrong with figure captions because I have definitely hit that as well. Uh, so I'm going to be in this o2-draft.qmd file. I'm gonna hit visual editor mode, use visual mode. And I'm gonna scroll down to this figure that I have where it's, um, it says for the AEPCT plot, I followed these recommendations. And then I have this include graphics call. And so this is creating this figure to show you. And you can see that it already does have a caption. So it says BMJ 2016 paper. And that's because I'm using that fig cap. I'm gonna switch that to fig 
dash cap, because that was my mistake. I'm having a hard time remembering my kebabs. Yay. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to add a label and I'm gonna add it to the chunk header, but you could add it with that um, chunk option called label as well. And I'm going to call it big, I think it's called F3. Um, I'm gonna render that. You shouldn't see anything change or show up here. I just wanna confirm. Uh, you do see it change because it adds uh, figure one. So it does start numbering it. So once I add um, that uh, fig dash as the label uh, to the chunk that creates that graphic, it puts it into this numbered environment. So instead of just having the caption that you're seeing here, it's not updating um, in the IDE, uh, but now it knows that it's a uh, figure one. Okay, so that's kind of step one. I have to have it labeled and it has to have a label that starts with fig dash. And then in the text, if I want to reference that, and I'm gonna make sure I get it right the first time, it's figure at, shown in figure at fig. And then in the visual editor mode, when you start typing, um, you do at fig, and then you can see that what's popping up is it knows that this is in the figure environment. So it's already giving me that option. So if I had a few different figures, in my document, I'd be able to pick them automatically. I didn't have to do any kind of, um, you know, slash anything. I just started typing. I did at fig, and I knew that my the name of my figure is fig dash f three. I'm gonna save that, render it. I close these down because these are not updating. And there, now you can see in the text, it actually updated. So I followed these recommendations shown in figure, and then it's repetitive figure one. You can actually change the language for what that looks like. But if you had that in a different portion of your document, when people would click on it, they'd be able to go immediately to the figure and be able to link back and forth. So that's a really nice way to do figure cross-references, but also figure numbering as well. So even if you left this bit out and didn't need to refer to it in the figure, say you're knitting to Word or PDF, uh, the nice thing is that you get automatically numbered figures for you. So you don't have to do the in-text references to get the benefit of numbered figures. Um, I can't tell you how many times I would write published research papers and I'd submit them and I'd realize that I'd actually switched figure one and figure two, you know, maybe my demographics table and my dropout table got switched. And then I'd have to go through the text of my article to change all the references in line to one of the figures. So the nice thing about having those um, in the article, even if you're not actually using the link, the linking part, because you're knitting to a um, output format that, you know, it's not really important. Um, the nice thing is having that automated figure um, numbering and updating for you. So that was adding figure cross references. I'm going to stop sharing my screen real quick and share again the slides. Okay, so what we did was we opened up O2 uh, draft, ooh, and a typo, QMD. <laughs> I thought I didn't find and replace, sorry. <laughs> and took the static image and I labeled that chunk with fig dash BMJ. I added a cross reference in the text, like C figure at fig dash BMJ. Um, you can try this again with the counts by site code chunk that I um, added below. Um, you know, if you wanted to test it out, what happens to see if you cross reference without a caption or if you use a chunk label that does not start with fig dash, I'll leave that um, as a choose your own adventure. And then I'll show you layouts real quick because this actually is something that I wish I had put earlier in the, the short course because this was one of the things that when I first saw the demo of it, it totally would have changed my attitude towards using um, literate programming for writing actual articles. And that is that you're able to actually combine figures into paneled figures, sub figures very quickly and easily. And you can do it across formats in Corto as well. Uh, so this is a kind of killer feature. So in the document that you have right now, I have sort of this lineup. These were those four figures that I've created for you. So when we rendered, we were able to see all four of them stacked one on top of each other. So I'm gonna show you how to do two things with those real quick. One is tab sets. These are only possible 
for um, HTML output, but it's a popular request in all of our different packages. So I want to show you how to do that in Quarto. Um, so I'm going to take this syntax here. This is called like a pandoc div syntax, these three, um, three colons, and then some kind of attribute in curly braces. So I'm going to quickly stop sharing the screen. Go to cloud. OK. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to enter kind of down below here. And I'm going to add a header that says like um, my tabs that's creatively. And then I'm going to start. Oops. Oh, I can't do that. OK. So it's dash panel. No tab sets. And then once you do that in the visual editor mode, it automatically sends you to this gray block. And you can see that dot panel tab sets ends up up there. Um, so I'm going to put two of my plots. I'm going to do age underscore histogram and my adverse events percent plot. So I'm going to put age underscore histogram. And I'm going to give it a header, age. Instagram. So this isn't a code chunk, even though it kind of looks like that. There's no border to it. Um, and this actually needs to be an actual chunk. Page histogram, because otherwise it doesn't know that this is an R object. OK. And then I'm going to make this, I'm just going to add echo false here. And then I'm going to say adverse events plot. I'm going to add a code chunk for that and make it, I think it's AE PCT plot. And then I'm going to make an echo false. So when I render this, what I'm expecting to see, what I hope we see, is that there's going to be a tab set object created. And each of these was added with um, two hashtags. So markdown level two header. I'm going to switch to source mode real quick and show you. So here's what that looks like. I've got this panel tab sets with three colons and it's encasing these two code chunks. And each code chunk is going to be printing just a simple plot. I'll run all the chunks ahead of it so you can see what this one is going to create. Oh, there it goes. Uh, so that's gonna create the age histogram. This one is gonna create the AE percent plot. But when we render, what we'd like to see is that they're going to be encased into tab sets. And each of the tabs are going to be labeled by this level two markdown header. So let's render it and then send it off to another window when it's done. So it should be at the bottom. And I added the anchor. So my tab sets is here. And oh, of course, it's not working. Um, I believe this might be a spacing issue. Erg. Paul, what did I do wrong? You go back to the source. Yeah. Not just the raw. Oops. Let's see. Oh, it need panel tab sets needs to be. Oh, the, duh. Duh. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Yeah, no worries. And then the okay, there we go. And then the space That's after the colon. Did. Yes. Thank you. you okay. So do as I had in my slides, not as I actually did. <laughs> Live coding is dangerous. It is. It's really hard because I can't see my slides. I really need like a dual yeah, screen set up. So it's like a pop quiz every time I come into this. I'm like... OK. Oh. Hmm. <laughs> Crash. <laughs> Allison. Panel tab set. Tab set. OK, y'all are seeing all my typos. I'm gonna nail it this time, you guys. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it only took us three times. Time. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right. So age histogram, adverse events plot. Uh, so that's really nice for if you want to have uh, HTML output. I love doing this for um, uh, slides, especially when you're making slide presentations. It makes things really compact. So you can have these tab sets, but you can also do one of my favorite features, which is using uh, layout. 
routes. And this is something that's really well documented, but I'm going to show it to you anyway, because I think it's going to blow your mind. So I'm going to add two hashtags to make a header here. And I'm just going to stick in source pane so I can see what I'm doing uh, a little bit more clearly. And then two hashtag, let's say layouts. Um, so I'm going to use my hash symbol and then the pipe symbol. And I believe it's layout and call to kebab. Ugh, kebab. <laughs> I don't know why I like the dots so much. Okay, layout and call two. Okay, so now I'm going to pick two of my plots. I'm gonna pick these two, um, both the survival ones. So I'm gonna put those in there. And by adding this option, layout and call two, and let's do echo false too, because that would make sense. Um, lowercase false. Lowercase false? Right. I think I should respect both. Petition to accept uppercase <laughs> formally here. Let's see. Yes, it respects it. Um, so, what it does is it puts it immediately into two columns. So, this is like the magical way for you to get these sub panels. And it actually works with figure captions as well. You can have sub figures with individual captions, and then you can have a global caption across um, the whole uh, paneled figure set. And this is really flexible. You saw me enter layout in call two. You can do in row, you can change this up. I'm going to add the AE percent plot here and change in call to three. So you can see that it goes up to three columns. This to me makes life so much easier um, for being able to format actual figures for publication. Go to layout so you can see it did three in a row there. Now, the life-changing thing about this also is that it's not just for figures. You can do this for tables. You can do this um, with uh, any art object that you'd like. Uh, so if you go back through these um, files, O2 Draft Revised actually does have some documents. Um, it does have some objects in there like demo tab and uh, follow-up tab and adverse events tab, which would be tables. You can try these things out um, and use that in call, uh, layout in call. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I'm going to show you where that's documented so that you can rejoice at how easy it is for you to change the layout. Simple, sounds simple is very difficult. Um, so if you go under using, it's under figures and layouts. And this leads you through a nice, a nice walkthrough. Uh, what I just showed you was what's under figure panels. So I showed you this layout and call, but I used code to do it. Uh, if you scroll down to computations, you'll see some examples with um, both Jupyter and Knitter um, plots. You can see it with tables as well. So you can see that I've made two columns of tables there. And you can also see how to make custom layouts by using numbers to specify the width of things. And those numbers are relative. It doesn't matter what numbering scheme you want. Like if you want things to add up to 100 or one or 200, it doesn't matter. Uh, and you can actually add white space in between. So this is a sub paneled figure with two plots up top, a little white space in between, and then a plot on the bottom that's large. Uh, and then sort of buried underneath uh, is a really great section also about block layout because we've illustrated this with figures um, and tables, but you can do this with any sort of block layout. So you can, similar to how we did the tab sets, you can use layout and call two with just plain markdown text as well. So you could have two lists, for example, that are side by side with each other. Um, I can show you, oh, I have to keep sharing my screen and resharing it. So as you can see, this is one of those features being able to lay things out was actually one of the things that used to just take me a lot more time and word than it should have. Uh, and being able to do this programmatically actually would have been quite a relief and it would have gotten me uh, away probably from my WYSIWYG editor um, if I had been able to like uh, very uh, precisely control exactly how those looked um, because I was usually trying to get these things exactly um, lined up visually, but it's really actually hard when you're not scripting things to be able to make them look like that. So you, here you can see that list one and list two are in two columns. So you can do this with any content. Um, you don't have to uh, you know, configure anything special for HTML. And I believe this also works for any of the other output formats as well. So I'm gonna end there and let Stefan take over uh, until 3.20 uh, for workflow. So sorry for stealing your first 15 minutes, Stefan. Oh, that is quite all right. Um, all right, so um, let me see if I can take over from here. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah, cool, okay. Um, 
All right, my Zoom window went away. Am I sharing my screen? You are, in fact. Looks good. OK, great. Uh, so hi, I'm Stefan. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm an assistant professor in lab medicine <clears throat> at CHOP in uh, Philadelphia. And in my section of the workshop, uh, we'll switch gears just a little bit and focus on, um, on workflows for collaborative clinical research uh, that center on Quarto or our Markdown or really um, you know, a, a computational document, which could be either Quarto or Markdown. Or, or markdown. And to give you a quick overview of this block, uh, I was going to start out by uh, discussing a quick case study in reproducible research uh, for my own work. Uh, then I want to uh, discuss sort of a model for how a collaborative workflow might work uh, when it's centered on a Quarto or, or Markdown document. Then in Meet the stakeholders. Uh, we will look at a couple of the types of people that you um, that you uh, surely will be involved uh, with in your project, and what what are their interests and what are their concerns. And so this may not necessarily reflect exactly what you are in, but I, I I'm gonna I'm gonna go over why I think this is why I think this can be helpful. And then from this at the end, I'm gonna try to give some practical tips for setting up your project for success. Um, so here's some background for the case study. Uh, so uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, or ALL, is the most common cause of cancer in children. And although 80% of, uh, of kids with uh, ALL are cured with chemotherapy, 20% are refractory, or they have a relapse. And relapse or refractory, or RRLLL, ALL, is the leading cause of cancer death in children, with a five-year survival of only 10% after the second relapse. So CAR T cells, CAR T cells are a new therapy, um, a cellular therapy, and they can induce remission in more than 80%, probably closer to 90% of patients with uh, relapse or refractory ALL, leading to long-term remission um, in 50 to 60% of patients. And this has been a really incredible game changer in cancer therapy. It came about nine years ago. So, so this, is, this is how... Um, this is how CAR T cells work. And here I forgot to animate my slides. So <laughs> um, I'm going um, I'm, I'm to just point at things. So, so here's how they work. You start by removing blood from the patients to get the T cells, uh, which are part of the blood. Then back in the lab, and this is the kind of lab that I run here at CHOP, you genetically modify the T cells um, with, with, a, with a gene called the CAR gene. And this is what allows it to attack the cancer cells. And then what you do, you grow up millions and billions of these, uh, of these CAR T cells, and then you infuse them back into the patient where you've taken it from. And so once in the patient, um, the CAR protein allows the CAR T cells to bind to antigens in the cancer cells uh, and kill them. And so you can imagine that as this is happening and having all these immune cells simultaneously attacking the cancer, you, that can get your immune system into overdrive. And that's exactly what happens. So patients get really high fevers, uh, they, they get breathing problems, or blood pressure problems, and this can be life-threatening. And this is called cytokine release syndrome, or CRS. And, uh, and, and, and in fact, CRS is the most important toxicity of CAR T cells. So this led us to the question of whether we can do anything to mitigate CRS after CAR T cell infusion to reduce this kind of toxicity. And so we conducted a prospective clinical trial because it was not a randomized trial, but it was a prospective trial for 70 patients, um, 50, of, 50 of whom had high tumor burden, which is the most important predictors for severe CRS. You don't really get bad CRS if your tumor burden at the time of infusion isn't high. So, um, so the intervention was to give a drug called tocilizumab. And this is a drug that blocks the IL-6 inflammatory molecule, which is one of the most important inflammatory molecules in CRS. And it blocks it from binding its receptor. And, 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 and we would give this at the time of uh, the, the patient spiking a fever. And we only give this to high tumor burden patients because they're the ones at risk uh, for CRS, uh, for high, for bad CRS. And so the predefined study endpoint um, was, a, was that we wanted to see life-threatening or grade four CRS in fewer than five, fewer than or equal uh, than five out of 15 tr treated patients with high tumor burden. And as the secondary endpoints in, included any negative effects of the intervention of the TOSI intervention on the efficacy of CAR T cells, 
you don't want it to uh, decrease the efficacy of your CAR T cells, right? They're an anti-inflammatory drug. So, so we also looked at remission rate, cell expansion, persistence. And so we did the entire analysis in, analysis in R markdown. And so, so R markdown is really similar to Quarto, which I think everybody here is aware of. So, um, so this table shows that we met the prospectively identified endpoint of less than five out of 15 patients with grade four CRS in the, um, in the, in the treatment group. And this was made with, uh, with the GT and GT summary package. So there's beautiful tables um, uh, you can make with, with GT summary. Um, and these graphs here show that uh, CAR T cells expanded normally inside of the patients in the inter intervention group, which is red, and that persistence uh, of CAR T cells was not affected. So we're not creating any problems with the intervention. And so we use ggplot, of course, and survival in the serve minor package, which well, for some reason I don't understand doesn't have a hex sticker. Um, we also created an online only reproducibility supplement to the manuscript in which we published all of the code for the analysis. And I wanna demo this real quick, but before I do so, I wanted to mention this, for this, we used the distilled package and, and built some additional custom functionality to create nice looking uh, data dictionaries and de-identified data that I hope to um, you know, find the time in the next couple of months to roll into a package and make available. But, uh, but let's, uh, let's say I'm a reviewer and I would, and then I, I see I see some predictive models in the I, I see a predictive model in the paper. Uh, so let me actually try to switch to that right now. And I want to better understand that predictive model. So where's my zoom window over here? It's okay. Uh, okay. Oh, here we go. So I'm sharing my screen, and now I have to do a new share. Okay. Uh, all right, so um, so this is this is part of the paper, and there's there's uh, there's a uh, there's some predictive models in here. So uh, so there's a logistic regression. Let's say I'm the reviewer and I read this paper, and it's like, oh, this is pretty cool. Um, but how did they do this this logistic regression? So I can go to this, I can go to the reprodu reproducibility supplement, and uh, which I'm going to show. In a second in this other share. Can you guys see this? Yeah. Okay. So so this this reproducibility supplement uh, is um it's a it's a it's an R markdown document that was that was uh, that was taken through distill, and you can see that uh, that uh, uh, that I have an introduction, analyses, data dictionaries, and a description of a computational environment. But now I'm specifically interested in. Or was it fig it was figure S2. So I'm just gonna look for S2 here. Uh, this takes me to table S2. I don't really want to see figure S2. So so I open up this this triangle. There's a bunch of code here. So I'm gonna scroll down. Oh, okay, yeah, that's the figure I'm talking about here. Uh, so and then we're looking for something that says model C, okay, the logistic regression. So I can just look for model. And I see, oh, there's a model C predict function. And so it looks like it's a function that takes, uh, takes the levels of three cytokines as, as, its in, as, as, as uh, arguments. And, and, and OK, here's the formula that they use to, uh, to do this logistic regression. And this, so I think what this, what this I, I really believe that such a reproducibility su supplement um, uh, is a really useful, useful way to publish analysis code alongside uh, a medical journal article. Um, so uh, get back to my slides here. Okay. All right, so, so this is all well and good, but, but how can you make this happen, this kind of thing happen for your own project? So you can see that the, the supplement was, was actually pretty long. There was lots and lots of code and analysis went in there. And um, so how do you make this happen for your own project? And so for the remainder of my time in this block, uh, or at least until, until 20 after, I wanna focus not so much on technical assets, but more on human and organizational factors that I found to be important and useful for doing this kind of reproducible clinical research, uh, specifically in the context of an academic hospital at the US, in, the, in the United States. So, so I, I hope this is going to be uh, it's just going to be helpful. So, uh, so to do this, let's first consider the life cycle of the data analysis. And what I'm proposing here is a slight modification of of Hadley and Garrett's model 
in R for data science that uh, many of you I'm sure have seen before. So I would begin by defining the objectives of the project uh, and identify pos possible data sources that, you, that you'll need to meet those goals. Then you uh, import um, the data into your favorite analytics platform, um, uh, which of course is R, and then you tidy the data by which I mean we're shaping it for analysis and also performing some data cleaning and quality control. Usually the next step will be to transform the data in some way so that you can perform visualization and modeling, which are the two main engines of knowledge generation. And this is a typical data analysis, transforming, visualizing, and modeling happens not only once, but over and over. And this is what's called the understand cycle. And it highlights the iterative nature of data analysis. And the final critical piece is communication of the insights in such a way that they eventually get turned into action. And it could be through a publication or maybe a reproducibility supplement like this or a report to a stakeholder or, uh, or some other way that the analysis can be used for decision making. And in reality, um, as you're working on this project, the workflow flows in both directions back and forth. And so you may, you may need to go back to, uh, to, a, um, to a previous stage uh, but but once but but when you actually want to uh, reproduce the analysis, this is this is kind of the, the you, there's a unidirectional flow of how you want the data to to flow through the system. So uh, during during development, it definitely goes back and forth. So now data analysis often happens as a collaborative effort. I usually have some sort of a subject matter expert. In medicine, that's often a medical doctor, but it could also be a nurse or a pharmacist or a psychologist or bench researcher. And you may have a technical expert. And this could be an, an analyst, a biostatistician, or a data scientist. So really, there's, there's many other uh, possibilities here. And sometimes one person plays both of these roles. And that does make things simpler. Uh, but there are real limits to what you can accomplish to your, on your own. So I'm going to assume that we're going to have two collaborators one technical and one a subject matter expert, because I think this is a common scenario in the academic uh, setting. And maybe if, you, if you're in this workshop, you might identify more strongly with one, with, with either one of the two in your work. So, uh, so the, uh, the subject matter expert might be in charge of the objectives and uh, in a traditional workflow, might be, they, might, they might come up with a project and, and do the data pull and then, and then, and then they will send this to the technical expert, and it's usually an Excel sheet, right? Uh, but what this does is, and, and then, and then these, the, your, your, your technical expert will, will work on this and they will, they will, they will tidy transform, uh, visualize model things. But what this does is it effectively creates a silo that the subject matter expert has no insight into. And, and this can cause errors um, that will be hard to spot because we're using Excel, which doesn't record user interactions, isn't reproducible. So the alternative that I would like to propose is centered on the idea that you have a central, you know, either a comp one computational document or a set of computational documents that are central and shared, and they would be written in quarto or R markdown. And the idea is that you work on building the analysis uh, uh, together, but uh, do you build the analysis so it's always in a state where you can rerun the entire thing to regenerate all of the analytic objects? I'll go into sort of a suggested, you know, set of files to do this later on. But, but so, so, so basically, this is sort of the idea of this reproducible workflow that would allow closer collaboration, more transparency, you know, more, you know, more confidence in the analysis. And I think it could also save time by catching data problems earlier and more rapidly iterating through, you know, the understand cycle. Um, and it, it would make it impossible to publish the code at the end in a way that is useful to others, such as in the reproducibility supplement. So now that's, that we have looked at this goal, let's, let's take a look at the stakeholders. So to figure out a workflow that, that will work and that produces a result that's useful for everyone involved, I think it's a great idea to figure out who you're working with. And this is really similar to the idea that as a first step of teaching a workshop, you wanna think about who you're actually wanting to help. And I think you know, going through a similar exercise is useful, can be useful here as well. So I'll introduce you to Ava who's our subject matter expert and project lead, and Ben, the biostatistician. And Ava and Ben are the two that will be doing most of the actual work of the project and, and, and will be kind of the, the owners and editors of the Quarto or, or the R Markdown document. But then there's also Peter, 
the principal investigator or senior uh, as, as uh, you know senior uh, clinical researcher. There's often some somebody like this, and then we'll also have Riva, who is an external researcher in the same field in peer review. And what I'm proposing is that we should look at all of these people to uh, to uh, to to think about the things that we should consider as we're building our analysis. So. Um, all right, so let's see if I can do this in 20 minutes. So let's meet Ava. <laughs> so Ava went to med school on the US East Coast and just finished a pediatrics residency at a major research hospital. So she's currently a hematology oncology fellow and she's about to start her first two research years. And she really, she, uh, she really uh, enjoys reading and learning about tech. So, so Ava, um, is working with working with Peter and she's she's embarking on a project to analyze and write up one of the clinical trials uh, that has been going on in her department and maybe it's a CAR T cell clinical trial who knows right so um and she would like to do this by writing a reproducible uh, report with R um she doesn't know about quarter so she's thinking R markdown but you know like so 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 she does want to use R though so um so, so Ava feels comfortable with Excel for data collection analysis, um, but she would like to learn R more, especially because she thinks data viz is great with it and also reproducibility. And she, last year she was at R Medicine, she took the 101 course and she started reading R for data science, although now it's sitting in the shelf gathering dust. Uh, and she's been using a little bit of R Markdown and ggplot for a few small personal projects, but hasn't really uh, you know, found, a, found a way into um, into, into using this uh, stuff for her research. So, so here are some resources and barriers that I would consider for her. So, so Eva is enthusiastic, she's eager to learn new things. Um, and she now has two years coming up of relatively protected time to do research as part of her fellowship. So she can devote multiple hours per week to learning and, and doing this kind of work. And she has the support of Peter, the PI, and Ben, the biostatistician for this project. On the other hand, some barriers are that, you know, coming out of, out of many years of, of um, no, nah, that was the next thing, but so, so she, this is the first time she's worked in a clinical trial. So all of this is new to her. And um, so it's hard for her to know where to start. Also coming out of many years of pre-med and medical training, which didn't include any programming or statistics, which I think is ridiculous. So uh, learning R is very new and very different for her. Um, so, so she, she certainly, she's certainly uh, good at learning and memorizing things, but but some of the mental models and in, in um, that, that 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 make it easy to to learn programming, uh, which just weren't you know exercised in her education. So okay, so let's meet Ben. Ben grew up in Turkey, uh, so he came to the U.S. and to get a PhD in biostats about three years ago, and then has been has been uh, collaborating and has since then has worked at the, in the oncology department, collaborating with several of the physician investigators there. Um, so he's not, not entirely new to this, uh, but also uh, hasn't been there for such a long time. So he plans to collaborate with Ava on the clinical trial analysis. And just like her, you know, they had a quick chat and both, uh, both, both agreed that it would be really cool to do this in a reproducible fashion, which would be different for both of them. Um, and new uh, uh, and and to to have everything in a reproducible report. So 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 Ben is 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 pretty um, is pretty solid with SAS and R, um, both of which he learned during his PhD. But when he used R, that he uses usually wide scripts, um, and I recently started using R Markdown as well. Uh, but usually, uh, you know, they they they, they uh, he he operates by the traditional workflow where. Where, where people send him Excel sheets and then he runs his in analysis files, which he has in his computer and many, many uh, project folders. And then he only sends Word documents or Excel sheets back to his collaborators and they're usually not interested in this code. Um, so, so Ben um, is excited to work with Ava on a new and improved workflow for collaboration. So that's a, that's a, that's a positive thing. Um, uh, and, and also he has, he's, you know, as a, you know, he's getting paid to do this kind of work. And so he gets he gets uh, uh, he gets to devote a, a number of hours per week to this. So this is great. But on the other hand, some of the barriers are that he doesn't have experience with actually sharing, collaborating, writing code with other people. He always writes it for himself, and he's the only person who has to look at it later on. 
And he's also a little bit frustrated because even though even though a lot of people talk about reproducibility at places like our medicine, there's um, it's uh, it's tough to find like kind of a, a set of instructions of how you get going, and always to, there, there always seems to be something new and better. So that's frustrating and difficult. Okay. So, so these are the two main players. Let's go to the supporting characters. So this is Peter, the principal investigator, he's the head of oncology and the PI of the trial uh, uh, that Ava is tasked to analyze and write up. Um, he thinks it's great that Ava and Ben is trying, are trying something new and cool. He thinks it might lead to reduced rework. Uh, he doesn't know any R or any other programming languages and has, has absolutely no desire or interest in learning any of that, that stuff. Um, uh, and so here, here, here are some here are some of his concerns, and and I was I was actually gonna gonna ask you guys to to suggest some things that Peter might be concerned about. So maybe we'll take a minute on that. So why don't you just write in the chat one thing that you think Peter might be concerned about as he is. Uh, it it will take too long. Okay, this is great, Miguel. Yeah, it'll take too long, right? So that's um, so writing code for all the analyses will take too long. Uh, any anybody else? All right, I have two more. So I think um, I think one concern that sometimes, uh, especially from sort of the senior collaborators, come that that if you share your clinical data freely, you might leak sensitive information. Uh, and then there's also this this idea if you if you if you share your code. Um, in a public place, and your name is attached to it, then, then, it, it, but you don't understand anything about programming. It can be um, can be difficult to uh, to to be be put in the position where you feel you have to defend something you don't understand. So, so these are these are maybe some of Peter's concerns that we may want to think about as we're building things. I'm not saying that we can completely address them, but this is something to think about. All right, let's talk about Riva real quick. She is a physician scientist at a peer institution. Uh, she's also an oncologist and she's very interested in the clinical trial. And uh, she's interested in this predictive model that's gonna be described in the paper, which she wants to validate and adapt for her own research. And that may be a, you know, a, an uh, opportunity for future collaboration between the two centers. So that's very cool to make that accessible. And uh, also, you know, looking at, uh, at being a peer reviewer, all else being equal, she, she would rate a paper, the, the same exact paper more highly if, 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 if it was if it was very clear that the analytic code and data are published alongside with the paper, then if, if that stuff is hidden away. So, um, so, so th these are our personas. They're of course made up and, and mixed and they may, not, they may not at all correlate to what, uh, uh, to, to, the, to, to, to the specific uh, teams that you work in. But I think there are some, some useful, useful thoughts in here. I, I definitely found it useful to, to think through this. Um, but now I wanted to, uh, I wanted to uh, for, the, for the last few minutes that I have, and I think I'll actually make it on time, um, uh, from this discussion of personas um, to, uh, to, to come to, to put together, to, well, to, uh, to suggest a few tips for how you can operationalize your project and get around some of these, some of these issues and actually you know, use them in your favor. So I think the major hurdle um, that um, that we encountered in here is that both Ben and Ava are doing this kind of for the first time, and they don't have a lot of guidance, and and so uh, and so, so they, they, they may not feel super confident in doing this stuff and having some and presenting things to to the PI. And so I think I think it's it's worth thinking about how do you how do you uh, how do you break down the huge task of cleaning you know many data tables from a clinical trial and uh, creating a dozen of more figures and tables and doing all of that collaboratively and reproducibly? And so in the last part of my blog, I want to offer some 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 tips that I think have been useful. They have been aha moments for myself, and I want to share those. And I hope this is going to be useful. So, so one of the things that I see people do often that you know start a new project with me now that I'm. You know, becoming a more senior myself, uh, uh, people, are, students are starting to work with me or fellows are starting to work with me, is that, is that they feel like they need to do a lot of work up front so they have something to show for, uh, and then they get overwhelmed. I'm having trouble hearing you. Well, that's okay, Siri. Um, so, and then they get overwhelmed 
and then they give up. And this is, this is, this is very painful. It really doesn't have to be that way. So I think a really useful thing to do early on is to come up with and commit to a process that allows you to, to bite off one little piece at a time and then also make sure that process works for everybody. And this, you know, I'm not presenting anything that's like, like crazy here. So, so this, may, this may sound super trivial, but it's so important. You get to set up a regular meeting about your, about your project, right? Weekly is great, every other week is okay, but I think longer intervals, whenever on the early TOSI project, we were in longer intervals, things kind of ground to a halt. So I really, you know, I'm looking, really looking for weekly or bi-weekly meetings uh, for, 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 for my uh, projects where, that I'm using this workflow for. Um, and make sure everybody who has a stake can join, and that includes Peter the PI, because their perspective you know, even if you don't have anything great to show for since your last meeting, no new uh, table, their perspective can be really valuable and save you from going down a rabbit hole. So if you have somebody senior who is part of the project, don't, don't you know, take advantage of them. Um, so next thing is, you know, write meeting minutes and review them at the beginning of the meeting. This is important for con continuity to also to hold everyone accountable. Uh, did everybody accomplish what they said they, they would? If not, why not? So they may be taking on too much work, uh, but it could also be that there's some kind of a blocker that needs to be resolved. Um, you should, you should, during the meeting, you should also review any new analytic work, such as new tables or figures that have been worked on since the last meeting. Um, and it's, it, here it's great to have RStudio with your quarter document open, uh, on, a, on a shared screen. So you, so you can uh, review the code, but also not only review the code, uh, but also quickly answer simple what if kind of scenarios, what if I you know, uh, only look at the top 10 of these or, and so on and so forth. Does, so here the question should be, does it show what you expect? Does it fit with previous data? Should there be any follow-up analysis? And this is, this is where the understand cycle is happening. This is where you're engaging the understand cycle, right? But this is at this meeting and you, you, each one of your meetings can be an iteration. Um, so, um, uh, next, you should discuss. You should definitely discuss any work that you that you as a group intend to accomplish until the next meeting, and that could be data capture, it could be data cleaning, creating a new figure or table, or revising a figure or table, or learning about you know distill or something like that. You know, like something something that's a deliverable. And so, for new tables, I think really the practice of uh, creating a skeleton table is very useful. A skeleton table is a is a table that only has your your categories, but doesn't have any data in it. So this is super useful. And for figures, it, I think it's an awesome idea to sketch out what you think the figure look, will look like with this data kind of drawn in on a piece of paper, because that both of those both of those things allow you to work backwards from an idea of the final product, which is something that you really want to have in your paper, to the data and the methods that you'll need to employ to get there. So this is this this is a very effective way to I think to move forward. Um, finally, at so, so, so you want to have minutes. So you, somebody should be writing meeting minutes and they should write down each person's goal and follow-ups. Um, and a, I think a good practice for building sort of a sense of joint responsibility for getting that stuff done is to write minutes collaboratively. So for example, Ava uh, could draft them and then Ben edits them and send them, sends them out to everybody. So, so here's, for example, um, uh, he, he, so, so I think writing goals like the example here which was an example from, from our early TOSI trial, can be super helpful to keep things on track. So, yeah, so, so you can see it's not a terribly long list of things. We have the persons who are supposed to do something highlighted. And, um, and so, uh, so really realistically what happens is a couple of hours before the next meeting, everybody kind of does their stuff, but, you, but you're actually making progress every week. So that's, that's cool. Um, all right, let's let's talk about files next. How do you organize? Where was that file? Right? I know that file was somewhere here. Somewhere. So I think it's really useful to have strong conventions about what goes where, and also separating the concerns uh, that are in the um, in the um, data analytic model, which is uh, uh, which, which is which is cleaning data, analyzing data, and and reporting data. Right. Uh, so 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 breaking these breaking these concerns into separate, into separate uh, R markdown, or this is we should really say QMD as of today, uh, documents that do this, do this kind of thing. So, so, um, so here's, a, here's, here's a suggested uh, organizational files. 
And this is inspired by the by the projects package, which I which I find useful, uh, although it's 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 um, it's much simplified from from this because I found that really breaking things into into these into these files and letting them kind of do everything myself. I, I found that I, I found that more useful for myself. Um, so uh, so so some of the ideas here are that the numbers indicate the direction of your data flow. They don't necessarily indicate the direction of how you kind of uh, build the analysis. You might have a ton of stuff in in, in analysis already when you realize, ah, oh, I need to do more data work. So you just tack that on. So, so really O1 data work and O2 analysis become kind of your, your lab notebook um, they're, they're not necessarily presentation grade uh, documents, but they have all the code and they are, they are, they're supposed to be reproducible so that you can, um, you can delete your O2 data tidy and O3 figures file, which get populated by these, by these documents and everything sh should get regenerated. So, so essentially the, the, the job of uh, getting your data cleaned up, verified um, and a tidy data set for analysis by handled O1 data by O1 data work. So this will load data from a database or, uh, or any files that are in O1 data raw and creates files in O2 data tidy. And those, those could be you know, uh, 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 CSV files or essentially the idea is to have tidy data frames in there, maybe as an RDS or maybe as a CSV file, or maybe both. I found it useful to actually have both uh, for different reasons. And then the job of O2 analysis will be to actually take that data from O2 data tidy and create figures and tables and drop them into O3 figures. And you can save them as PNGs, uh, as, 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 as various different formats, but that way you'll have them available. Um, and if you, work with, if you work with version control, you can actually use take advantage of, of nice, nice uh, visual diffs to see how your analyses have changed after you made a, made a change, which is pretty cool. So, um, so, the, so, so another idea is that uh, O3 report, um, in, in my workflow, I've actually just made this a clean version of O2 analysis for creating the reproducible report, which, so, so this is this, this, this in my case was a distill, these uh, O1 and O2 were regular, regular R HTML notebooks, and O3 was a distill, uh, which was set up to deploy directly to a, 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 a GitHub page. Um, so, um, so, so these, these, are, these are some suggestions. This is work for me. I, I think these, there, there might be some useful ideas to take from this. I have no idea what, it, what, the, what, the, what the core to a project for distill is going to look like. I hope it's going to look a little bit like this. <laughs> OK, so um, let's talk about style. So make your code easy to read. OK, so for a reproducible report, readability is way more important than performance. Um, and because people are people that are interested in reading your code are probably for the most part not professional programmers and that may include you six months from the day so so really like read and stick to the tidyverse style guide it, this is very useful and that you know uh, I, I i kind of make everybody who works with me on an r project read. it's not very long and it makes it, it makes code review if that's something that you want to do that you can do much easier also, use pipes. They're great to emphasize sequence of actions, and they are, they make intuitive sense to Peter who doesn't know R. The pipes are awesome. Also, the dplyr verbs. Those things make sense. So, one of the really cool things about R, I think, is that they can um, using using uh, idiomatic tidy R is uh, really helps the non-programmers feel more confident and that they understand what what's going on. Which, of course, they don't really. But it it makes it it makes it easier to kind of explain to your PI how exactly you're doing something, which can if if you can't do that can really grind things down. Um, anywho, um, right, this is this is one of my favorite X, XCD, X, uh, XKCD comics. This is Git that tracks collaborative work and projects through a beautiful distributed graph theory tree model. Cool. How do we use it? No idea. Just memorize these shell commands, type them to sync up, and if you get errors, save your work elsewhere. Delete the project, download a fresh copy. And this is how this is how I use Git. This is how I use Git. So a note on version control. Um, and then, so uh, so 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 if you've never used a central version control system like GitHub before, I think you should look into it. So uh, it's. It, I, I, so, so similar to Dropbox, GitHub allows you to keep a central copy of all of your work and be sort of a disaster backup that you really should always have. 
But it, the, the other thing that really can do for you in this kind of a project when you're when you're going through iterations is that you can do code with you and you can actually do um, uh, with with the visual um, uh, with visual diffs you can actually review uh, changes in your analytic objects which can sometimes be really interesting when you see that something that uh, more than once something that I didn't think should have changed changed and that allowed me to find a subtle bug in my analytic code because a Kaplan Meyer looked just a teeny tiny little bit different and I realized I dropped three patients. So this kind of stuff can happen and you can really, uh, so it can be really used for this. But um, so the RStudio IDE supports Git and GitHub and also GitHub Enterprise, uh, which is you know your on-premise version of GitHub and Jenny Bryan's uh, book, Happy Git with R is awesome. Uh, and it's a, it's a great introduction. I do, however, think that there are legit reasons for, not using a central version control system when you're working on you know, clinical trials. Um, and this is the case, I think, if you don't have an on-premise instance of, your, of GitHub Enterprise or GitLab that'll, where they allow you to store sensitive information. Um, also, I, I do think that there is you know, a learning curve to this additional overhead. So you, you may not want to learn R and Quarto and GitHub all at the same time. So, so I get it. If you do, um, if you do uh, not opt to go with GitHub for your project, make sure that still doesn't get you out of not backing up your data. You definitely want to use something like Dropbox uh, or OneDrive or whatever your organization uh, supports for disaster recovery. And then the other thing that I really uh, recommend is that to stick to a convention for for including the version of file name because you're gonna to have to do manual versioning of your, of, your, of your data. And so here I really recommend going with the ISO 8601 date. So ISO 8601 is a, uh, is, is a lexicographic date, which means that, um, that uh, essentially it means that when you or, so, sort things by name, you actually sort things by the correct date. Um, so, uh, so, 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 and then and you maybe also wanna tag things by like whoever last edited this. And, and I think this works. You can, make, you can make this, you don't need Git and GitHub, but if you have the time, um, uh, I, I suggest you look into it. And if you have the option, you, you, should, you should look into it. So, so doing a quick recap of this, of the stuff we talked about. So the, uh, and I know we're three minutes over, um, but I'm almost done. So the reproducibility supplement, that's a mechanism to usefully publish analysis code alongside uh, a journal article, including a medical journal article, which doesn't usually publish code. Um, a reproducible collaborative workflow that centers on a shared computational document like Quarto or R Markdown can really increase the confidence in the validity of the analysis and have a lot of other benefits as well. So then um, we, we looked at the stakeholders uh, whose needs, barriers, and concerns uh, you may want to consider and they include subject matter expert, technical expert, uh, a principal investigator or senior clinic, clinical researcher, and a peer, peer researcher or reviewer. And then to operationalize your research, I recommend you adopt an iterative workflow with regular meetings, organize your files, write easily write a readable code and using version control all help. Um, all right, thank you. That is all that I have for this session. It's 324. Um, I think we should take one minute real quick. Paul has a small announcement with a link, right, Paul? So we're going <laughs> to. Right. Uh... Yes. <laughs> and then we'll take a five minute break. <laughs> right. So uh, the next section is going to be me showing off a few things of what you can do with Quarto. Um, mm -hmm. And then during that time, we're going to be collecting questions uh, through this link here. So uh, we're going to take a break. Go ahead and put your questions in there. We'll come back, I'll show off some stuff and then we'll get to your questions afterwards. So the questions can be anonymous if you'd prefer, or you can ask in the Zoom chat. We'll we'll stay and hang out and listen to uh, all your questions and try to answer them. The nice thing about Slido is that you can see if other people have asked your same question and you can up or down vote it. So that will allow us to better triage some of the most important questions or the most common questions that we can find. So take this time to take a quick break. We'll come back right at 3.30. Um, but if you do have a question, a burning question that you really want answered, maybe try uh, hooking up with Slido. The link is in the chat. It's also on our, um, uh, our, our short course website where the question mark icon is. So we'll see you guys in five minutes, 3.30.
So Stefan, are you hanging out? Yeah. Or are you taking a break? Okay. <laughs> hey, <laughs> I dork out with you for a second. Okay. So I had so many notes while you were talking. I thought, you know, one of the things that um, I showed in, I guess the, it was in the O2 documents was being able to source an R file and kind of what you were saying about the workflows for the different, you know, O1 data now, I think you had the data work, O2 analysis, and then O3 is like the supplement. I think those being able to source a separate R script is really yeah. helpful for those later ones because you often find that those earlier, you know, RMD or QMD documents that you're working with have maybe a lot of code and it's yeah. really hard to read. And, you know, once you get to a certain point, you sort of like gotten what you needed out of that document out. So I really liked that you talked about the separate RMD documents. So I wanted to point out that people can actually use that trick of doing source and have an R script that's external. You can also use child documents and NADAR the same way you do with right. our markdown in a yeah. Porto document. And that's another way to kind of um, reuse work that you've already done, um, but have new R Markdown documents that are sort of like one level of abstraction higher where they're maybe just like, they're, they're pulling code from different places and executing it and getting the output, but they're not necessarily the single source for all the, um, all the code. And that's a really nice, uh, place to know that you can get to when you're having those meetings and you're moving on from the meetings where you're talking about wrangling to like the final paper, you're, you're not like, oh gosh, here's all that ggplot code that I don't need. Or here's like a really, really long like sequence for analyses just to get like one number out. Um, so, so that's kind of nice for, um, for the workflow. So I wanted to call people's attention to source um, uh, in the O2 documents and then also looking up NIDAR child documents as ways to, you know, have that so that you're not focused, you know, on making a clean, clean, clean document, you're able to like reuse the stuff from other places. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was uh, exported figures. I'll show that maybe right at 3.30 when people come back, because that's another thing that I found at meetings was really helpful was like, you know, there's the report, but then in, in a meeting, sometimes you're wanting to like pull up like, oh, what was that GG plot where you had like the violin plots versus the scatter plot versus the box plots? Like, let's pull those up really quickly. So um, I always found it really useful. And, and one nice thing about Corto is that it automatically exports all those figures. So I'll show that really quickly when we come back. Um, and then the other thing I was thinking is that, you know, it's kind of nice, like those, those intermediate documents, those are really nice because you don't have to worry about output formats as much you can just like use html and make it really useful for yourself and share mm -hmm. it even just like sharing your screen or publishing it and that's where like tab sets and stuff like that is really nice because i used to have like it was like i think of it like the eye doctor test so like we'd have a bunch of different figures and it'd be like which one do you like better figure one or figure one a figure one b or figure one c you know <laughs> and they, like with tab sets you can make it so that you don't have like a dump of a lot of stuff and these really long documents, you can have it like side by side and, and let people be able to explore that. So it's kind of nice to think about like, like I actually feel like the most high powered stuff that I did with our markdown as a scientist was like the, the stuff before the final paper. Mm -hmm. Like all those little yeah. pieces that go into it. Yeah, no, no, you, you, I, I, I agree with your point about like creating all these uh, additional documents because, as I mentioned, you can you can use them for 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 various things like pulling them up together or maybe putting them on a PowerPoint slide to show them next uh, side to side. Actually, one thing that I uh, was was planning to mention is that when we were doing this early TOSI thing, I very seen I was working with a very senior PI. And he was not going to learn R, and, mm -hmm. and so so we we actually just really just looked at PowerPoint slides of the figures, and that worked well because yeah. because one thing that needs yeah. to be, remember is is that is that you really want to reduce the cognitive load for for the not especially for the non technical people as you're reviewing stuff, and and so this is where it can be a real downside to kind of scroll wildly through a through a markdown document. Yes. And, um, mm -hmm. And so, so for, for that reason, I think it's it's really a good idea to kind of spit out the figures. And when you come to figure review, maybe just look at a PowerPoint slide um, that has nothing yeah. on it for the figure. Um, so, mm -hmm. so that's, yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. So we're back at 3.30. So I'll share real quick um, uh, what we were just chatting about. So I'll share my screen. Oh, I think you have to turn off your sh screen share. There we go. Okay. Let's see. So welcome back, everyone. Um, I was going to real quick share some thoughts I had after Stefan's uh, great redux of like how to collaborate with people who don't use R, which I think is 
uh, most people's lives if you're doing medical research. Um, so I was going to share that, you know, one trick that might come in handy when Stefan was describing those workflows of having like, you know, multiple RMD documents for different stages of where you're at and where you're at with your collaborators is to eventually move to a place where, you know, once you've maybe, you know, extracted all the value you have out of a certain RMD document, like you've, you've figured out which figures you want to show. Um, it's really nice to have external files, like you can have an external, you know, R file that creates all the figures for you um, and external RMD files even like QMD files as well um, that create the different things. So those are the things that maybe hold most of the code at a certain point. And as you get kind of further along in your research project, you can do things like either source an R script um, like I did here. Uh, and that allows you to just kind of like plug and play and, and plug in like, you know, the graphics that you've made in where you need them to be. Um, and you can do this with an R script, like with source, or you can also do it with child documents um, using NetR. So you can actually pull in different um, uh, RMD documents. Um, I'm not sure exactly how it works with Corto yet, but um, that's something that I'll test and get back to you guys on. But I recently did this for um, a paper on the Palmer penguins that Allison Horst and I did, where we basically had a ton of figures and we created a separate file that created all the figures. And then the actual paper itself was more of like, you know, as Tom talks about, like um, the control panel, like it was my it was my big combination document. And and that's for a certain stage in the analysis, but it's good to know how to do it. So you have an example here of how to actually do that, which is a really good um, workflow example. And then the other thing that I wanted to mention that might be relevant, again, for what Stefan was talking about was one of the things that changed my working life as a scientist was being able to pull out the figures from an R Markdown document um, and being able to share them with other people really quickly. So here, because I've already rendered this O2 draft, it created this subfolder called O2-draft underscore files. And inside there, you'll see figure-html. And what you'll find is there's all the PNGs for every single figure that we made. So you can actually open them up um, and explore them. And if you name your chunks, uh, that create those something intelligible, this will be a lot more intelligible for you. <laughs> so the reason it says unnamed chunk 41, 42, 43 is because those were all unnamed chunks. I didn't name those um, those chunks that created those figures. But if you use knitter chunk labels, what automatically gets exported when you click render is something more like this, counts by site dash one. And that's because I, um, I had that one uh, labeled here. So that one had a... Um, had a figure label attached to it. And that was really nice for me to be able to attend a meeting and have people be able to really quickly see a bunch of figures all at once. And they didn't necessarily want to scroll through a, a document. So I just wanted to share those two things real quick before we hop into the Q&A. So let's, um, let's give a few minutes for people to uh, ask their questions. And I'm going to ask Paul maybe to pull up what I asked him to prepare, which was the fireworks display at the end. So to kind of show you guys all the things that you can do with Corto that we, you know, we, we jam packed this full, way too full actually of information about Corto. Um, but Paul is going to real quick do a, an overview of um, some more stuff that you can do. And then that'll give you guys time to ask some questions in the Slido and we'll tune back into there. Oh, can we save a copy of the project in our, our Studio Cloud workspace? Um, uh, Paul, do you know how to do that? Um, no. Let me share my screen I'll, real I'll, quick then. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just do it really, really quick. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. I think you have to stop sharing your screen and all. I sure do. <laughs> okay, sorry, here sorry, you go. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna do it real quick. Okay, so back in our studio cloud, uh, the way you do this is to go into each of those projects and it's actually really, really nice. You click on more and you're gonna want to, oh, here, let's go up one more. Let's go up to, up here. If you click on the up arrow, you get to this point and you get to just click on project altogether. And then you do more export. And then I'm going to call this one like O2 authoring. And then it should download a zip file with all the folders in it. So the trick was you see this view, click on the double dots to go up one and then check that box, more export. And then it should, yeah, it automatically um, downloads with all the, all the files in there. So that's how you get the files out. Um, and then uh, I think uh, Paul does have some helpers for getting you installed with Corto locally. So I'm gonna stop yes. sharing my screen now. Okay. All right. So, 
Uh, before I get started with like the wrap up of the presentation, I want to plug uh, Tom's presentation tomorrow on our markdown. Uh, Tom, if you're in the uh, if you're around, did you want to say a few words about this? Yeah, so a lot of what Allison was talking about with like sourcing external files and using R Markdown or in the future Quarto and QMD to do things. Uh, this presentation is really just about like motivating you with a couple of examples of how to do said things. So sourcing files, using child documents, um, parameterization of R Markdown, that kind of thing. Uh, there'll be a lot of code examples in GitHub. So if you feel like learning a bit more tomorrow, feel free to stop by. Awesome. And like Tom was saying, there's going to be a lot of uh, things that will carry over to Quarto. So um, this is definitely a great place to pick up some cool tips. Um, all right, so moving on to the wrap up, I made this little slideshow presentation. There's really not much in here. Link in the chat. Uh, so we're going to talk about installing Quarto on your own machine, uh, Quarto support for Python and other editing programs, and an example project site. And I'm going to set a timer for 10 minutes and hold myself to it. Um, so if we go to the Cardo example site here, uh, this is, so this site is also built with Cardo. Um, and on the introduction here, there's some instructions on how to install it locally. Um, the, the gist of it is that you need to download the Cardo CLI from the Cardo GitHub. And I put a link in uh, the description here. If you follow this link, it takes you to uh, the current, the latest version of Cardo. And you just find the, the version that's, uh, that matches your OS. Go ahead and download that, open up the installer, put it on your system. After that, um, if you wanna work with RStudio like we did today, uh, like Allison mentioned, we need to get the daily, the RStudio daily build. So if you just follow this link here, it takes you to the RStudio daily place. Again, find the one that fits your OS, install it. And once you have those two set up and good to go, you're able to do the stuff that we did on the cloud on your local machine. But part of uh, what makes Cardo so cool is that it has support for like other programming languages and other editing modes. So I'm gonna have to switch out the share screen. Oh, I didn't think about how to do this here. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so like I said, Python and Cardo has support for Python and Jupyter. So let's see if I could get it going. Uh, you might not see it right away, but hopefully it pops up afterwards. So in the background, I'm starting a Jupyter notebook. Uh, can you guys see that? Yep, it's showing up. All right, cool. And then I'm gonna open up another window for Corto serve. So on this window here, I'm gonna open up a Jupyter notebook. Okay. But, okay, so open up the Jupyter notebook here. And so if you're familiar with Python, you should be familiar with what this looks like. Um, and what I want to point out in particular is that what makes Cardo special with interacting with Jupyter Notebooks is that all those chunk options that we learned for Knitter and R Markdown actually work in Jupyter Notebooks as well. So this is an IPy Y and B document. And you won't see, you won't see the actual like thing, the actual um, captions and labels show up in the Python document. But when it renders in Quarto, um, you'll actually see all that stuff pop up here. So this window here is a live preview of the project that I made in Quarto. So changes I make in that document are gonna show up here. So for instance, um, if we look at this figure here, I labeled it fig polar. And I said the caption is a straight line projected in the polar coordinates. I also put down a citation or a, re a cross-reference here. And so the Jupyter notebook, I'm just working, I don't have to know anything about you know, using R Studio. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have to know anything about using R, but if I know Jupyter Notebooks and I know Corto, then I can get outputs just like this and just like you're expecting with uh, Knitter and R Markdown. So you see that it has the labeled figure. It has the cross-thinking, the cross-referencing link to the figure itself. And it respects the code chunk objects I put here. So for another example of this, here's like a huge brick of text a huge brick of functions and test documentation that I made. And most people don't care about this, but again, uh, because Carto knows about the code junk options um, and works with Jupyter Notebooks, I can just add the stuff here at the top of the cell and it's gonna render just like this here with this nice code, 
code folding button with the code summary description here. So I could click and open and close it. And so like something else that's really cool about this when we talk about collaborative workflows with people in our lab, you know, it's great if everyone works in R, but a lot of times people don't. And sometimes there's a holdout, like there's people that want to just work in Python and they don't care about learning R. And so previously in the past, you'd have like people, you know, uh, make a Jupyter notebook and try to host it online and it looks awful and it's hard to style it. And then you have the, like the R markdown documents and they look better, but the styles are completely different. What's so great about using Corto with these kind of setups is that Corto renders all the documents and makes, it applies the same styling to all the documents. And so it all looks like one cohesive whole. So that brings me to the projects of uh, Corto. So blah, 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 blah. Yeah, Corto projects. So briefly, a Corto project is a way to combine all your documents together into one sort of whole. So typically you'll see like on the Corto org website, this is a Corto project known as a site. So, you know, you have all your different documents here and you tell Corto how to unite them all with the Corto.yaml file. Um, another version of this is Corto Books, which is what this, or this site is. So if we go back to the example site that I put somewhere up here. Yeah, so this Corto example site, this is again, is a Corto book um, project. So what's special about Corto projects, first off, is that again, it tells, it, it tells Corto that all these documents belong together. It tells Corto how to render them together in one project. Um, it tells them how to, it tells Corto how to, you know, fix navigation between the two. So for instance, like this is, this page is one separate Corto document. And at the bottom, there's links to get to the next page. Um, there's links to the get to the next page again. There's a search bar here. So now I can search within the whole project for different things. So I could say, for instance, um, uh, best blast hit. So I wrote some stuff on, you know, doing statistics on a best blast hit level. So it takes me right to that, to, right to that section, and I could go uh, and check it out from there. But what's really cool about a book project is that we can uh, combine all these different documents together into like one output document. So you know, talking about that collaborative workflow again, let's say that you know one person is responsible for taking part of this analysis. This person, this person's trying to make figures, or whatever. You know, um, you can have each people work within their own document and upload it to the site. And then uh, someone responsible for rendering it can go ahead and render the whole site, push it up to GitHub or wherever you're hosting your site. And there'll be this button here that says you can download it as a document. So let's go ahead and click that and see what that looks like. And maybe you can't see the Word document. I'll just switch to that real quick. Yeah, so. I went ahead and just uh, I'll put everything to a single Word document. And so these, so this Word document is made of four or five different Cordo Markdown documents, and it's put it all into one thing. And so people interested in your work can you know look at the individual Cordo Markdown pages, or they could just download it entirely as a paper. So personally, what I'm doing is I'm working on a new paper uh, for my PhD research, and so I have I'm, I'm going to have a page for literature review, a page for methods, a page for you know, discussion and results and all that stuff. And so this is a really cool way to work on it individually at a time. But then when it's ready to ready for, you know, publishing, I go and just download it as a PDF and send it off. Um, and I think that's it. Uh, okay, are you going to triage our Q&A, Paul? You're let's do it. Us? All yeah. right, let's check out Slido, see if we've gotten any questions so far. Maybe, maybe before, before we go there. Um, yeah. There's, there's a quick survey um, for the oh, course yes. that I would like to, I'm going to post this in the chat. Uh, and uh, it, it, should, it shouldn't take you more than two minutes to finish. Um, so I really appreciate everybody's feedback uh, on the workshop. And so look at that at your own leader. Yes, uh, please. And then let's go to Slido. All right, the top right. most voted question is from Anonymous. How do I get my PI to buy into this? He doesn't think it's worth the time. Oh, that's fascinating. Anybody <laughs> else want to take this or shall I? Well, I, my first instinct is to say that, you know, the time you put up front is worth it because when you're scrambling to get everything together for publishing, you want to be able to just 
point and click something and point you want to have been doing it already yeah I think for me um uh I, I think I think as a graduate student you can kind of do it um without necessarily asking for permission ahead of time <laughs> personally um I would have just done it um I don't know that there's too much overhead it depends on if you've used our markdown or not um but either way um I I honestly don't don't know that uh, there's a time sink element to it. I think it's all gain. Um, I don't think there's ever a downside to doing more literate programming in your lab. Um, I I know for my own lab when we started getting everything um, under version control and having everybody be able to see what each other was doing, it really reduced mistakes. Um, it really reduced miscommunication and it reduced our need for a lot of um, meeting times. I felt like there was a lot of meetings where we were in like hamster wheels about like. You know, oh, well, you know, were we going to exclude these participants or include them? Or, you know, is this data that you're showing me, you know, Masood, is this like the most up to date data? Like, was this after we decided this exclusion criteria was implemented? Like, there was a number of things where we would have to go like racing around, chasing our tails, trying to figure out like the data this was done and the date the data decision was made. All of that stuff just ends up being taken care of when you have it all documented um, in like a reproducible workflow. Um, so you're able to not just document like what you did, but why you did it um, and how. So usually my lab documents were like at the very top, my notes about like decisions we made about this analysis. And then, you know, like a date, a time, who was there. And then like what we decided and what we talked about with the code below it. But um, trying to make like a, a decision document really helped me. Um, and I think there's actually some really good, if you're a graduate student, there's a really good blog post by Lucy D'Agostino um, McGowan about like, dissertating um, and how she did it with reproducible workflows. And I think that I that like is just not even possible to do if you don't use these kinds of tools. Um, I remember being on a bus with a, a student named Ira Wang in Australia and she just showed me her whole dissertation on her phone because it was a book down um, PDF and she was able to just show me and she was like, that's incredible. Like, I, I think if you have a PI that's opposed to it, they they haven't seen the light and that's okay, but that's kind of um, something that I think you can still adopt and use and benefit from. Yeah, I, I would add to that, that I totally agree with not asking for permission. I think I would, I would- Revolt! I would, I would, yeah, exactly. I would, I would also <laughs> say that proof just to show that it is uh, uh, productive, yeah. you know? And so here, this is, this is really, um, this is really what my section was all about. So if you come in and you have a plan, you know that you're that you have some even just a little bit of something to show for every week. They're not going to care how you get it done as long as you get it done, right? And then else you're going to get interested in this. But I, yeah, I um, I, I mean I, I think there are also ways to use reproduce to to do this kind of thing in a, in a way that you do lose a lot of time if you don't you know have a strong organizational. I think the difficulty is that um, when you do things like everybody else is doing, you're probably going to do, but just by chance, you're going to do things productively. But if you are, if you want to do things differently, you gotta be more intentional about it. And um, and so so that's what I was hoping to uh, to to discuss uh, in in my section is how you can be intentional about it. And um, yeah, it's a yeah, great. I, I remember being. A graduate student way back in the day and literally going through this conversation with my PI about why should I even use R? Is it even valid for like statistics? And so I remember running my systat code and my R code for weeks and just showing that the results of like our ANOVAs and our plots were all the same. And I started showing up to weekly meetings with our markdown report. It right. took me two seconds. Like I just clicked knit on the new mm -hmm. data. We pulled new weekly data in with our animals, our mice behavioral data. And I could finish my work literally walking to the office uh, instead of taking like three hours in a day to do my Excel and then move it over into this for plotting and then move it over to Systat for statistics. Unifying is good. Awesome, lots of good advice. Uh, let's move on to the next question though, because I think we could talk about this forever. Uh, any <laughs> workflow tips for gathering and incorporating comments from collaborators into manuscript revisions when they don't use R. Does hypothesis help here? I think it can. I don't think it's the full story, but I do think that we're, I know us at our studio are really thinking hard about this problem because we feel like we want people to be able to have that kind of like, you know, experience that 
you've all grown used to using Google Docs, for example. And we actually hear from a lot of users that they're like exporting their R Markdown stuff to things that they can then import into Google Docs. And then they're doing some kind of rigmarole there, trying to get the comments back. Because a lot of times what you see is like the people who aren't comfortable with R and want to make comments, they just want to comment on the text anyways. They don't really, they're not going to like change the code. They, they don't want to touch it. They're like, they're like, don't show it to me. I just want the, the, track, the track changes. Um, so uh, that is definitely something that uh, is on the radar um, internally here um, and, and close to what I think Corto you know, would aim to be. Um, but in the meantime, I think hypothesis is a good enough solution for some of those um, moments, but they're not necessarily going to work for the final, your final draft of anything, right? Because your final draft of anything is going to be a, a, a Word document or a PDF that you have to submit. But for all the, all the stuff leading up to that, I think if you're sharing and getting feedback, um, hypothesis is a nice answer to that. All right. Uh, next upvoted question is, should we wait until Cordo is supported in a stable version of our studio, or is it worth the pain of daily builds and potential problems? Looks cool, and I am keen. Uh, if you're keen, I think you're safe. Um, I think <laughs> uh, we've all been using it um, uh, in prep for this workshop, reinstalling. I, I reinstall the, um, the command line interface, you know, maybe like once a day, once every three days or so. Um, we stopped development for this workshop. So uh, this is technically a stable release because we froze it um, at the beginning of August. And in fact, one of the developers is here, Charles. He's actually supposed to be on vacation, but uh, I think he was uh, keen to hear people's feedback. Um, but yeah, so uh, I think you can go ahead and download it. Um, it's unlikely that things are going to break on you um, in terms of the overall structure of your projects, because at this point, things have stabilized enough, I think, on the API. But um, I don't know if Charles is still here. I'm going to flip through the names real quick. Um, hey, he's here. He's here. Um, I think it's pretty stable enough that I would encourage you, if you're keen, to go ahead and give it a shot um, uh, and, uh, and watch, the, watch the news and watch the repo so you can see when things have been changed. I, and so, hey, Allison, this is Charles. Yeah, hey, Charles, hey, Charles. <laughs> um, I, I totally agree with that. And I think the one other thing that, that hopefully you can vouch for is we do, we, we try to fix things quickly. And yes. So if we do, if you do let us know about an issue, we try to be right on top of it and, and turn something around as quickly as we can to get, get people back up and running. So we'll continue doing that. They are. And I should note that Charles has basically spent the last like year of his life developing this tool that uh, only internal people have been using. So I think it's really exciting to hear people's feedback about it. Um, yes. But they are extremely responsive to GitHub issues. It's all open source work. Um, so uh, it, if you go to corto.org, I think there's a link to the GitHub repository there. And under about, you can see a little bit more about how to contribute. But we really welcome issues at this point, feedback for features that you're interested in or things that you're running into on different operating systems. Um, that's extremely extremely useful to us, but it is a tool that is still under very active development as opposed to maybe some of the more um, uh, under maintenance uh, packages in the R Markdown ecosystem. Those are not necessarily switching very frequently. This is one where I believe Charles and JJ are going to be working on it pretty actively for the next few months. Um, but that means really adding things, not necessarily, hopefully not breaking things. If they do, it's a regression and they want to hear about it. But um, I think that we're, we're to a point where I don't feel as scared to tell you to go ahead and use it. All right, and I put some links in chat for the, the Corto GitHub, so you get some issues directly there. And then we also have the Corto documentation site um, mm -hmm. that you can uh, read about there too. Yeah. All right, uh, next question is, any thoughts or use cases for Knitter Spin as a way to render an R script to a report? And then there's a oh, link. Yeah. Yeah, um, you know, I think I think that's really a comfort level for where where you want to put your your thoughts. Um, I think so. Spin for those of you who aren't aware of it, it's when you take an R script and you add um, some kind of you can add like some minimal comments to it um, uh, and be able to spin it into an MD document basically. So it's sort of like a render, but it only goes to MD. And I think it's really nice for being able to quickly share a snippet of code, um, a little bit of code for wrangling or for making a plot, and then the output at the same time. So I usually do it when I've got somebody on the receiving end who's familiar with Git or GitHub and can like see that rendered um, uh, spun code. Let me see, I've got an example actually in one of my repos of doing spin. Um, so I think it's useful for that, um, but uh, I think um, uh, I think I probably don't like uh, 
the way it forces me to write my words and as comments um, because it's not as easy for me to to write. I like being able to write full sentences without having to comment every line. Uh, so it's a little bit restrictive in that way for me personally. But for certain use cases, it definitely um, works. So I'm going to throw um, this repository into the chat. So this is one where I came up with a bunch of like um, smaller examples of code to um, to share. Uh, so here's here's an example of the, an R script that I then used knitter spin um, to make into this markdown. Um, so you can see that you're you know you're a little limited from uh, what you can add to the R script. You know it's kind of more like really basic comments, and every comment has to be started with that. Um, it's a Roxygen tag, so it's a hashtag and then a um, a single quote right after that. So um, I find it a little bit less readable. It's kind of more like a, a code first markdown second approach, whereas I think a QMD file or an RMD file is more of like ideas first code, code to support the ideas, um, if that makes any sense. So I think there's definitely use cases for it, but I probably wouldn't want to write much more than a few snippets in it. I think I'll put yes. a link to knit our spin uh, in there too for people who don't know. Okay. Awesome. And then these two questions are kind of related, so we'll just take them at once. Uh, in workflows like those uh, Stefan described, are others finding that RMD documents replace most of the R scripts? And can R code from a QMD be exported to an R file or to an RMD file? So QMD to RMD is just changing the Q to an R. And then some minor YAML changes. YAML, yeah. Yeah, but so QMD to RMD is pretty straightforward and trivial. Um, exporting RMD to R. Um, yes, that you can use Perl. Um, so you can use Knitter Perl to uh, to Perl out all the R code from all the R code chunks from any RMD, and I believe it should work for a QMD too. Um, so uh, so that's a way to get out what you um, what you put in. Um, I can pull up a, it's in a private repository, but I have an example that I can share. You can keep going, Paul, sure. with the other question now while I do that. Yeah, so that's what, so that's why I thought that was related to this other question about RMD documents replacing most R scripts, because some of the pushback I hear sometimes is like, well, I just need an R script to run on an HVC. Mm. Like, why do you need an RMD? Well, like ah. RMD is kind of like the sketchbook and then you can convert it to like an R script. Um, pretty straightforward. Yeah. Or it's like the, you know, if um, if you're wanting to develop it in the um, in an RMD file, there's no trapping. Like you can always get all the figures out, you can get all the code out. So I'm gonna real quick share my screen. Yeah. Um, so this was from um, a paper that's being reviewed right now. Um, so let's see. Oops, that's not the right one. So this is a paper on penguins. Whoops, it's a text file. Uh, so this is the actual R markdown with the actual um, paper written in it. Uh, but, uh, and this is kind of what I was talking about with workflows thing. And I think Tom might talk about this as well. It's, it's reading in all of the plots from a separate R file. Um, let's see, um, uh, penguin plots. So yeah, here's all the plots are in here and they're just so long that we couldn't include them in the um, in the document. So we, we read them in and then kind of plopped them where we wanted to. And then um, because this is a format that supports that when you knit this document um, and you can run knitter Perl as well, what it does is it creates this penguins.r file. And so all the code chunks that I marked, um, I set a global chunk option. This is a normal R markdown document. So I set a global chunk option of Perl equals true. Um, so you can see that all the chunks that are marked Perl equals true get got in here and it even pulls from that external file. So even from that penguin plots.r that I read in, it pulls from those. And then I think there's a few where I set Perl equals false because you didn't really need to know what, um, what my global chunk options were in that 
penguins.r file, but every time I render this, it creates, it pearls out all my code for me in a nice kind of commented form. So somebody could just run all this and be able to create every single thing. Um, and this was actually a requirement of the journal. So it was a really nice time saver for us to mark, to make it in our markdown, make it useful for us. But purling essentially says, ignore all the text, like ignore the narrative and just pull out all the code from the R chunks. And then you can control which code chunks go in and without and which ones don't with this purl chunk option. So I set it to true by default for everything and then turned it off for some of them that weren't necessary. So I think purling is really, really great for um, for those kind of use cases where you've got somebody who says like, I don't need to see the, the RMD file. It's like if, if, if you choose to work in RMD, you don't have to feel trapped like your, your code chunks are all living in this one document. All right, so we're right at six o'clock. There's a couple of questions left, but I do want to be respectful of everyone's time. Uh, what do you think, Allison? I'm okay to hang out. People can leave, but I'm okay to um, answer a few more questions if people sure. have more questions. Okay, well, for the, everyone leaving, uh, thank you so much for joining us. We really had fun today. Um, thank you all. It was really great to meet you. And then Looks like we have a request for an intermediate training course in Corto. <laughs> <laughs> so Charles, I think that's a good endorsement. <laughs> All right. Well, um, were there any other questions, Paul? Yeah, can, yeah, yeah. I can answer so, some on this. Uh, from Ray Belize, I hope I'm saying it right. Um, I'm giving a lecture on this stuff next week. I would love to get thoughts on what text functions to teach. I'm teaching stuff in Stringer, XFun, Scales, and Glue. Oh. So I've got a lot of mileage out of, um, like the most basic thing I got mileage out of was, um, you know, transforming variables from snake case to title case using yeah. like string under string replace with string to title so that's a pretty straightforward one i also i don't it's kind of along the same thing but like separate to separate a column into two different uh data columns i got a lot of mileage out of that um what do you guys think yeah, I would say one thing that um, depending on how uh, how messy data is, maybe um, uh, before string to title or the string R ones, you could just do janitor clean names function. Um, that to me is like the killer function <laughs> like that. <Yeah. laughs> that saved me. It does so much more than just the string part. It takes care of symbols. Um, if there's spaces in the variable name, I think it automatically does underscores. I mean, it just like cleans it up, makes it tidy. Um, so I would always do like the, the here package to import with file paths. And then the next step would always be janitor clean names before I do anything else. Um, I think those are really high value functions to share with people. Um, all right, and then we have, um, I guess more of a comment. Um, so much raw day to day. Raw data today is in JSON format. Most text and string processing challenges are wrangling these often irregularly nested data into tidy data frames. <laughs> I see Tom nodding. <laughs> yeah. It's a challenge, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, Tom and I had a bad foray yeah. into JSON, nested JSON together. <laughs> I'll let him answer that. <laughs> so what I will say is that, yeah, JSON historically has been painful to work with. Well formatted JSON is actually handled really well by TidyR 1.0. So unnest wider, unnest longer, unpack, and unchop are like tailor made for the problem of read in JSON, get to flat data, data frame or tibble. Um, there's some examples on the TidyR website about that. And uh, I actually have two blog posts about cleaning up JSON data with TidyR. It's, it's amazingly powerful as long as the JSON is formatted properly. If you get a uh, malformed JSON, then it's just like any other messy data and it doesn't actually unpack correctly. So you do have to do some more complicated things, but good JSON is just like any other good, good data format. This, this reminded me of- uh, Oh, sorry, go ahead. It just reminded me of a case where I was scraping uh, Match, match statistics from a League of Legends server. And it wasn't in a nice format because all the different things were different sizes. I'm just looking at my code. It's like unnest, 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 pivot, unnest, pivot, 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 unnest. So it's horrible. 
Yeah. What were you saying? Sorry. <laughs> oh, no, I was just going to say, say that um, we released a new tidy our cheat sheet uh, this week. So I think what Tom was describing uh, about uh, what's in tidy R 1.0 should be uh, nicely described um, on there. And tidy R as a package hasn't had its own cheat sheet before. It was inside the data import cheat sheet. So that might also be helpful. Um, and so in general, all of our cheat sheets got a huge makeover uh, this week. Uh, so if you're teaching, uh, you might want to turn your students on to looking at those. If you were, if you were avoiding teaching with them because you thought they were too out of date, then now's the time. <laughs> They're up to date as of today. And then our last one is a yes or no, I guess. Is there a tool for comparing two R Markdown documents in R Studio? Mm, like a diff viewer or something. Yeah. That is a really nice feature of Word where you can say like, here's the master and then here's the, the revise and then it does like the line by line. I don't know of anything, but there might be some gene. I'm sure there's a package. <laughs> there's always a package <laughs> that does something like that. <laughs> diff R from Nash. R, okay, maybe. And I think Git is the ultimate. Like I, for me, like if you can use Git for version control of your R Markdown or, or Corto files, like that is uh, really nice. And if you can, even if you're able to work mainly in a private repository because you can't share the data or something like that, um, you know, being able to uh, to to adopt a workflow that allows you to use version control that's a real um, a real sanity saver being able to see what you're changing, why you're changing. There's so many times where I look in my get diff viewer and I'm like, oh, why did that change? I forgot that I had like deleted this section and moved it here and then I forgot to paste it over there. You know, there's all kinds of things that you catch by yourself. And that's, that's everything. That's it, we cleaned we, out the questions. We did it. All right, fantastic. Thank you guys so, so, so much for coming. I, I feel like, <laughs> this is so fun. I'm, I'm fun. a little, I'm a little bit starstruck every time I see you, Allison, and now. Oh, stop! Um, <laughs> did it three years. This thank is you, awesome. Thank you so much for, for <laughs> three years in a row. <laughs> I know. Um, so I, I hope that did you guys will will have some some time to actually look at the main conference. I think our keynotes are going to be really really interesting. Um, I'm so excited about like, Karen Deep, right? Dr. Yeah. Singh. Yeah. So, so both are both talking about kind of algorithmic biases and which is a, such a hot topic. And yes. And, and we, we discussed this a little bit at some point, Allison. I, I, I really, yeah. you know, I really hope that something like ethical uh, um, or, you know, socially aware algorithms will become mm -hmm. kind of a thing that, that, that uh, our studio will look into maybe as part of tidy models um I, I think it would be really cool uh, to to do some of that stuff so um so i hope that you guys uh find the time to to join the if, if you don't have access to the conference i can i can uh, uh i can um i can help you with that just, just let me know uh, if you haven't signed up for the conference i can get you uh um, uh, we signed up. We registered. Yep. <laughs> all right. Just want to make sure. <laughs> but thank you all for joining us. This was really fun and uh, very energizing to finally get to share uh, some of Corto with everybody. Uh, we've all been working on it for a while now and enjoying using it, but I uh, haven't really introduced it to a cohort of learners. So this was really fun. Uh, so I hope you guys enjoy exploring it. And please don't be strangers if you have issues or struggles with it. Um, you have my contact information. Um, uh, on uh, my website, there's a contact form there. Uh, and then I think all of our uh, contact information is, is probably all over the place. So feel free to get in touch. You can share this, feel free to share Quarto with you know, your teams, your, your lab mates, anything like that. Um, we're not trying to keep it a secret, but it is under active development. So we're uh, are trying to make it better. So bye. Great. <laughs> bye everyone. All right, bye everybody. Bye.